the Corvella School Board meeting for May 6th, 2021 is called to order. I would like to ask you if you're willing and able to join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome everybody for joining us. I want to uh, share the apologies of uh, Director uh, Tina Baker who couldn't uh, join us for tonight. And uh, Director Therese Jones will be joining us shortly uh, by uh, video. Uh, we I'm have- uh, I'm here, Sammy. Wonderful. So Director Therese Jones is available by video and uh, uh, Vice Chair Sarfinger McDonald is available by video. Uh, Director Vince Adams is uh, available by video and Director Levy White Bear is available by video. And uh, Jay Conroy, welcome, uh, is available here in person. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good reminder that uh, we're getting uh, closer to the end of the pand pandemic, but not yet. And as we celebrate our students coming more in person, uh, we will have some of our board members joining us um, as the time, uh, as we move on uh, with, uh, with the time. Uh, I want to share a few uh, comments uh, first, uh, which is I want to welcome the community members who are watching us uh, over YouTube uh, live or recorded. If you want to refer to any of the agenda material, you can go to uh, the uh, description section of the video or on the website for the Corval School District meet the board and there is the agenda packets. Also, I want to mention that some of our uh, board members and community member uh, speakers might not be able to have the video on all the time uh, and will be available by audio only. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, board members reports. Uh, and I would like to share uh, that, actually I'll go last, but I do have a list of uh, three things. So any board members have a report to share? Lou? Um, I just wanted to share that it was great to um, stop by a couple of the uh, meetings along with Sammy to hear feedback on um, the equity policy um, that we received feedback at, um, so that was nice to be able to hear um, some of those and I'm looking forward to that conversation later. So thanks everyone for your input on those ahead of time. Thank you. Uh, next up is Sarah and Vince and as a reminder for Jay uh, uh, raising the virtual hand also for those who are here through the, the platform so you can be in the same line. Uh, so uh, Sarah. I just wanted to say this at the beginning of the meeting where, when we might have more of an audience. Um, I was at the uh, vaccination clinic at Reser today with my son. He got his second shot today. And I just want to let the community know that the, the clinics that are going on at Reser this tomorrow and Saturday are walk up. You don't have to have an appointment. They are extremely well run. It is a operation that runs like clockwork right now. So I encourage everyone who is 16 and older to head over there and get your vaccinations. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Vince? So thank you. Um, it seems like every meeting I'm reporting on negotiations, uh, but this time it's a little bit different. Um, so the district has entered into negotiations with both of our labor associations, but instead of negotiating, um, uh, memorandums of understanding around the pandemic, these are actual contract negotiations. So, um, and just, I wanted to note that our district and our labor unions practice uh, interest-based bargaining. Um, and that is a process, you know, a consensus-based process that tries to come to a win-win solution uh, for, for both parties. So um, we have lots of meetings scheduled. And so that process is ongoing. Thanks, Sammy. Thank you. Okay. Um, Sammy, thank you for the time. I have two comments. One, the Oversight Committee, Bond Oversight Committee has met, and I just want to, I know we have a report coming, but I just want to commend them for the time they've spent and the conscientious attitudes. They're, they're taking their responsibilities very seriously and working very hard. My other one is more of a personal um, 
sharing in terms of my job takes me into schools to observe student teachers. I've been, for the first time in a long time, been in schools. Um, and two of those were Crescent Valley and Corvallis High. Um, we could go on and on about the impact. Uh, I would say a couple of quick comments. Number one, kids are pretty quiet compared to normal, which is an interesting perspective, having not been near each other for a long, long time. Um, secondly, they um, are very excited, I think, and positive about work. And so it was just a real positive time to be there. Arrows on the floor and lots of things being done to keep them safe. But uh, it was just actually very joyful and thrilling to have them back in building. So nice to be there. Thank you, Jay. Any other board members want to uh, provide a report? Sarah, are you good? So I do have three items to report. And the third item is a check-in as well. So the first item I want to report, uh, this is a teacher's appreciation week. And I want to uh, say uh, we appreciate our teachers uh, for their contributions and uh, their hard work. And uh, they've been the heroes of uh, the previous year and this year and for years to come as they support uh, this generation. Uh, thank you for what you do. And as a board, uh, we are committed and uh, for your rights for uh, collective bargaining and providing policies and funding. So you have uh, uh, fair conditions, working conditions, and you continue to support our, uh, the students of this community. So uh, thank you for, for all what you do. Uh, the uh, second item I want to uh, share is a constituent shared with me and emphasized that uh, to report that with, uh, with the board. That's Corvallis <coughs> Valley High School debate team uh, member, uh, Kate Voss, who is also a CV student uh, board rep, was a state uh, finalist in impromptu speaking. And her performance in impromptu won the CV team fifth place in the 5A division. Uh, this is the best CV team has done since 2015. Kate Voss and CHS's Suraj uh, Kulkarani, Kulkarani uh, who's also a former um, a student rep at the board, have uh, uh, been selected both for the South Oregon World uh, School Debate Team. So uh, Suraj and Kate, congratulations on this great, amazing accomplishment. It's uh, one of the amazing uh, testimonies that our students continue to learn, grow, and accomplish during these hard times. And uh, having real world learning, seeing you uh, uh, use these skills in real world like applications and competitions. So congratulations. Um, I want to also report uh, and I, I do a check in with board members around uh, this is the time of the year where we do self reflection and self evaluation for the board. It's been the practice of the school board to do a board evaluation where we evaluate our progress and our goals and commitments. And uh, the first question I want to ask is uh, and it's not about to just check in. Uh, do we want to do a board evaluation this year? And maybe <clears throat> by raise of thumbs, uh, or if you're on audio, uh, let me know. All right, so I see lots of thumbs up. Um, now, the second question is, there is two ways to do it. There is, uh, we could have uh, the evaluation and we get the results in a brief summary. Uh, or do we want the full in-depth 27 pages of criteria uh, evaluation that will be provided by Kristen Miles from OSBA? And that would need to have a specific agenda item uh, to have a facilitated discussion during uh, the uh, July, uh, June meeting, which has been allocated. We have allocated that. So the question is, uh, do we want to do that? Same thing, thumbs up. All right. Um, during a facilitated conversation, we look at what are the areas of strength uh, that need imp needs improvement and set a plan for the board to get there. If we don't want to add another, uh, well, that's, yeah, that's uh, basically the idea. Now, what I want to say is the process, uh, we will reach to OSBA and they will send us a form uh, for those who, we all, I think that we did it last year. Uh, it will be an online form we need to fill and I'll communicate with you a deadline that's appropriate for Kristen Miles to process the information, develop the report, and give us the uh, feedback with the packet for next meeting. Uh, I want to highlight something very important uh, that uh, 
that these self-evaluations are research-based uh, and uh, they are based on five roles, the five roles of the board. And the, they are anonymous, so the anonymous responses will be provided in the reports. And um, we're using this form specifically because it has shown a measurable impact on student achievements uh, when fulfilled well. So this is a practice-based, science-based form that helps school boards self-evaluate and uh, see how they're doing. And that work really correlates in, uh, directly to uh, student achievements. So that would be the plan and I'm looking forward to that. With that, uh, any further uh, school board members reports? See none, moving forward to superintendent's reports, Ryan. All right, thank you, Sammy. So I have a few things that I wanted to share tonight. Um, the first one is uh, teacher appreciation, as Sammy just uh, highlighted. So the first week of May each year is teacher appreciation. So for us, that's this week. Um, after a year, a year like no other, I want to acknowledge the dedication and commitment of every teaching staff to do what is best for our students. Teachers change the lives of kids every day. And in a year where instruction could be virtual, in-person, or a mix of both, their immense work and impact have provided a much needed sense of community and connection. Despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, teachers across our district are working hard to support all of our students and we're grateful for all they do. So again, uh, appreciation for our teachers. If you have the opportunity to see them, be with them, please um, make sure to continue to encourage them um, as we continue on with this year like no other. So um, again, thank you to our teachers. I wanted to also bring up uh, graduation ceremonies. So last week we shared with our high school families that we're beginning to plan on-site graduation ceremonies for uh, CHS, Crescent Valley, as well as College Hill. Um, as long as the Benton County, um, as long as Benton County remains in that high-risk category. And according to the governor, we're going to maintain an high risk. So um, the odds are continuing to go up that we'll be able to hold the ceremony. Uh, but due to the social distancing requirements for the event, each student will receive two guest tickets um, and also we will have two ceremonies at each school because of the number of folks that tend to come. So what it means for board members is that you will um, have to choose or attend um, two ceremonies rather than, well, you always attend two, but now this year, two of the four at our comprehensive high schools as well as College Hill and Wings. Um, so it's a little different than in the past. So um, Parker will share some information with you about dates and times, and you can let them know what works for you with regards to those ceremonies. Also, a couple of other highlights for you. Again, this is week one of our return to full on-site learning across the district. And our staff are excited to have students back in our schools, as well as our students, as Jay commented. And we're following safety protocols to keep everyone safe and healthy. It's important for families to screen their children for COVID-19 symptoms each day and should not send their kids to school if they have primary symptoms. When we're notified of a positive case of COVID, our health and safety team begins their protocols, which are working. The individual with the positive case of COVID is contacted by the district nurse and details about potential exposure are gathered. We then work closely with the Benton County Health Department um, in terms of the investigation. Staff and parents or guardians of students who have been exposed um, are contacted individually by phone. And depending on the investigation and recommendation of Benton County Health, um, exposure, exposed individuals may need to quarantine for up to 14 days. And individuals who were exposed um, are those who are within six feet of the positive COVID individual for 15 minutes um, or in a, in a 24 hour period. And that's why our school staff are working hard to help students follow the safety protocols at school. Masks and maintaining six feet distance reduces the risk of, of exposure. Um, and those are things that we um, have in place that will continue to communicate to students and families um, over the next six weeks. Um, the number of individuals that have been required to quarantine is low. Um, and at the district website, there, it includes a link to our home, from our homepage with a direct link to our COVID dashboard. Uh, staff and families can expect that in every case, we'll notify exposed individuals immediately, um, followed by notification to the entire school community. And finally, as Sarah shared about the process of brown vaccines, 
there will be a team day at Research Stadium on May 20th. So that is uh, going to be uh, an 11 to 7 o'clock time, I believe, um, which will, there will be activities for teams to encourage them to come um, that day. And Benton County Health Department is still working on what that will look like, the conversations such as raffles and other things for teams is part of the conversation. And finally, we're also continuing to pay close attention to the update from the FDA regarding our 12 to 15 year olds. We expect to have more information for them um, and their families sometime next week. Um, lastly, we will also have a uh, Samaritan Mobile come to College Hill to provide um, options for vaccine there. Um, again, recognizing that that is a, a group of students who um, it would be beneficial to have an on-site um, clinic. So we're planning to do that alongside Beck County. Um, another highlight is summer school. Our recovery of learning planning will take place in three phases. In phase one will be summer programs that will take place from July through the end of August. Phases two and three will be conti a continuation of academic and other supports over the next two school years. Our students will receive additional instruction, mental health support, and opportunities to gain their confidence after the pandemic year. While we have offered summer programs before, this year we have additional funding that will help us expand and enhance the support available for students. <clears throat> in addition, we're partnering with the Corvallis Parks and Rec program um, in July and August and with the Boys and Girls Club Child Care program for the entire summer. Academic support this summer will include a five-week credit recovery program for high school students and academic boost programs for both elementary and middle school students and families will be receiving more information next week about those programs. So again, we're very happy for the support that's come from the state to really allow us to have a robust summer school um, in the summer that that's really gonna be important. So um, we're reaching out to the staff right now to bring them up on board for that. Um, and again, just looking forward to that opportunity and those partnerships with the club and Parks and Rec. Planning for next fall. So we're planning to fully reopen for five days a week of in-person instruction in the fall. We will follow all guidelines from the Oregon Department of Education and the Oregon Health Authority, which may include protocols such as wearing a face covering, frequent hand washing, and some form of physical distancing. The first day of class will be September 8th, and calendars have been shared with families and are available on the district website. Also, additional federal and state resources have been made available to the district to address the impact of COVID-19 and continues, um, and the impact it continues to have on our educational community. We'll strategically leverage these one-time resources to make investments to strengthen existing operations and identify new and expanded programs and services that will provide the support our students need as we emerge from the pandemic. Details of these proposed investments will be presented as part of my superintendent's budget message at the budget committee meeting May 20th. This year, both Crescent Valley and Corvallis High School were again recognized by the US News and World Report 2021 Best High School Rankings. Um, those rankings are based on a number of factors, including um, academics, college level exams, graduation rates. Um, and we're proud of the success and continued success, success of our high schools um, and their continued um, recognition on, on that list. Later tonight, the board members will have an opportunity for a first reading of a revision of the educational equity policy. The policy will, um, will help us create more inclusive and equitable schools for students, staff, and the community. As is stated in the background document, our district acknowledges the historical, generational, and compa compounding reality of, a, of the systems and structures that have intentionally created opportunities for some groups and perpetuated inequities for others. Listening to and seeking to understand the perspectives of our students, staff, and communities of color illuminates the urgency of this work. After several discussions, emails, and meetings with former theater students, we're taking immediate action to support changes to the CSD theater program to ensure that all students feel safe and welcome to participate. We've established a new advisory committee, and the application for new members is open through the 8th. The Theater Diversity Advisory Committee, TDAC, will be a committee recruited, recruiting from district staff 
student representatives, community members, and alumni coming from underrepresented backgrounds and or experiences in anti-racist work to advise the theater department's uh, play selection, casting, and diversity and equity efforts. Assistant Superintendent Melissa Harder and Equity Coordinator Marcian Rivera Fucci will be liaisons to the committee. I have two more updates for you. The next one is School Lunch Hero Day. So tomorrow is School Lunch Hero Day, and I'd like to thank our food service team for their hard work and commitment to our students. Between preparing healthy meals for our students, adhering to strict nutrition standards, navigating student food allergies, and offering services with a smile, our food service staff are true heroes, and we thank them for the 496,558 meals they've served since the end of March. Mm -hmm. So nearly half a million meals. Wow. A year. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. And finally, um, at Adams and Wildcat Elementary, we have um, a story walk project. Um, thanks to the district librarian, Dana Zachary, and the library media technicians at Wildcat and Adams Elementary Schools, two pilot story walk installations are on display outdoors at the school. It's a creative way for our students and families to enjoy reading and the outdoors at the school. Um, thank you to the library media tech technicians, Echo Wu at Adams and Christy Kegler at Wildcat and district staff, Elizabeth Wyatt, who worked with public library staff to make this happen. Laminated pages from children's books are installed along an outdoor path. As you scroll down the trail, you're directed to the next page of the story. And the books used for the Wildcat Story Walk was um, I'm Every Good Thing, and at Adams, it's Dreamers. A physical activity is also included at each page of the story, adding a suggested movement. And again, thanks to the Corvallis Public Library for their participation and partnership in that project. So I had a lot to share. There's a lot of great work going on. And again, we're just excited to be at this stage in the pandemic, having students back in schools um, as we move forward with the five or six weeks of the school year. So thanks for allowing me to report. Thank you, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Uh, board members, any, uh, any questions or comments? Jay? Uh, one comment and then a question. I, I don't know that you mentioned it. I don't think you did, but the graduation ceremonies will be live streamed in addition to the two tickets per student, right? Correct. Thank you for adding that. Okay. We, re we recognize that that is, um, that's a challenge for some families. And at the same time, we're trying to have those ceremonies in person. And so that's the balance we're trying to see. So a YouTube connection or something like yep. that. Okay. My next question without getting into names or specifics, perhaps, could you give a quick picture of the concerns that were raised that led to the theater advisory committee. I, I heard you mention play selection and casting. Were those the concerns or were there more? I would say that those were um, several of the concerns that have been raised. And um, it's a piece that Melissa has really taken on um, and, and been involved in those discussions primarily, um, but it's also meeting with um, past um, participants um, and getting their perspectives as well. And so that's um, those conversations have led to this um, next step. And those past participants focused on play selection and casting or others? Um, as, as a couple of those points. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Any board members have a question or comment? Lou? Hey, Ryan, I just have a couple questions and thanks for the um, really uh, detailed report, especially the updates in fall. I know that's on a lot of people's minds, and so it's great to have that information. Um, yeah. I had, and you answer one of the questions, I was really curious how the phase back was going this week and everything, but um, I'm trying to still get a, um, a sense of what the supports are for the cohort C and quarantine students, what those look like. Um, and I was hoping we would have received a little bit more of that with the fuller in-person going back um, and how families can get more information if they're not receiving those supports. And then I have another question after that one too. Sure, so um, really what I would say to that is that um, I have had um, multiple conversations um, since the, over the last month with families and I've encouraged them to continue to reach out to their school um, to have those individual conversations about what their children need. Um, today, I get received an email um, that from a parent saying 
this is this is actually working out better than I had anticipated. Thank you for doing that. Um, so what I would say is if that's not the case for a parent, that I would encourage them to um, reach out to their school. Um, I think that our what we've been able to do that way has been to create some individualized planning and conversation. And I think that's a really important piece of, um, of where we go for the next six weeks. So if parents are still feeling like they um, there's additional questions or needs that I would um, encourage them to reach out to their schools. Okay, thanks. I feel like the uh, big response is about the, um, the, uh, the support like with their peers, being able to see their peers and how that was looking. And so um, I feel like some of the schools at least are having opportunities for connections. And if that's not happening or they feel it's not happening with their class, they should be reaching out to that, to that specific um, school, right? Yep. To make sure first. Okay, just so they follow the steps. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I know that's really hard. I like I've said before, I have um, all the kids in, and students in my house are in cohort C, so I understand like it's a little bit of a whirlwind right now, and so it's um, that continuity is helpful to have, and um, and hopefully that continues to be strengthened as we get fuller into school the next few weeks. Yeah. Um, and then the other um, one I had, I've asked this before, like several times leading up to Fuller in person, what kind of supports are, um, are in place right now with this transitionary period? It creates a lot of anxiety. I know folk are both excited and anxious, and there may be a little bit of fear as well mixed in with the excitement of going back to in person, especially when there's notices about um, being received about COVID cases, even if it's just one person. Um, so what is that emotional and mental support looking at like for students for that transitionary piece? And I was hoping we would have an update for that by now. Um, yeah. When you, um, when you say you're, you were hoping to have an update, um, were you hoping to have a report on that or how Not necessarily sort of information um, would be most beneficial to you? I, because I don't, because I want to be able to hit the mark and I just want to, better understand yeah. that. So what I've been asking about has been like, what kind of um, support is offered to students, like knowing that they're gonna be feeling these anxieties going back to school after being out for so long. And I haven't heard much or seen very much being released in notices to families about how students can access support for mental health mm -hmm. and emotional support with some of those anxieties. And I just wanna make sure that um, because this is a huge shift, like we've been um, mostly away from each other as a community for um, a little bit over a year now, and now people are coming back together, and that does, uh, that clearly is exciting, but it's also creates anxiety, and I just really hope that we have some resources available, families know where to look, that that's available um, for them um, to help them get through, because I think there will be people that may not reach out directly to the teachers automatically, like students or families. And so if there's somewhere they can find on their own, that'd be helpful. So that's kind of, maybe we can chat about it at the next meeting, um, but I'm, I was hoping we can have um, some of that information during one of our the updates too. Yeah, um, and that's, please, yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, that's um, okay. That was it. <laughs> I. Um, and I also think it's a way for us to um, share information with our updates to families about where resources are available. So um, thank you for, for mentioning that. And so we'll work on getting more information out. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Cause I know I've asked a couple of times, like this has been in the back of my mind, like we need to have this in place cause we know it's a need. Um, so I appreciate you spending some time on that. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. That was it. And thank you for the rest of your report too. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So uh, we need to move on now to the student uh, uh, representatives report. And uh, let's start with College Hill uh, student representative, uh, Jesse Martin. Jesse. Hi. I'm going to turn my camera off just so I don't have any malfunctions. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you, Jesse. Thank you. Um, so right now, College Hill has about 65 students coming in regularly to work. Um, we 
We were going in from nine to 12 before everyone else started going in like Crescent Valley and uh, Corvallis High School kids started going. But this week we switched from nine to 3 p.m. And it's been going really well. Um, we should have about 18 students earn their GED along with um, 25 to 30 earn their diplomas. And that number, like, we expected it to be closer to 10. So it was a very good surprise. Um, but students and staff have really stepped it up and more kids are coming into school uh, with tremendous efforts to graduate. And from a student's perspective, the teachers are working Jesse, I think we lost you. And I hope you guys could hear that. But now I can hear you. And I think last thing we heard is the students are getting started and that's where uh, we lost you. Well, the students are getting started. Um, I don't know exactly where I left off. Uh, we have 18 students earning their GED. Did you guys hear that part? Yeah, we heard, we heard about the graduates and then we, we lost you after that. Okay, the graduates. Okay. Um, well, we just have more kids coming into school every day and um, we've seen really great efforts. And from a student's perspective, I can say that the teachers are really, really motivating for the seniors and they're really great advocates for all the students at College Hill. And I know that without them there, we would not have the amount of students graduating that we would this year. Wonderful, but thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Thank you, Jesse. Next up is Corvallis High School and we have Ezra Hart and Kristen Moon. Yeah, um, first just wanna say that uh, the return to full in person has been super exciting. Everywhere you look are people like we've never seen before. Um, and the freshmen all seem really excited and engaged. And it's super fun seeing the teachers that we had last semester that we can finally see in person. It's all been really encouraging. Um, our sophomore class presidents have planned a few spirit events to celebrate um, our return. Um, the first one is a cookie decorating competition that's this week and next week. And what's super cool about it is that all these spirit events are not only open to the people who are in person, but also to the online students. So we're still trying to create like a student body that's still together. Um, and on the performing arts front, the choir program just had their second virtual coffee house, um, which is where students perform and share pieces and it's all up on YouTube if you want to watch. Um, and the program is currently pre preparing for their spring concert, which is scheduled for the end of May. Um, CSD Theater has recently announced that they're looking to revive um, Mamma Mia for next year, uh, which is super exciting to think about having students and community members back on stage performing. Um, and sports are going great and the long awaited winter sports season will finally begin on Monday. And Ezra has a few more things. Yeah, as we get closer and closer to graduation, we have lots of things planned to make it memorable for our seniors. One event that is really exciting is grad night on June 1st. Seniors who visit participating restaurants and stores downtown in their cap and gown gain access to some great discounts and chances to be entered into raffles. And then finally, Kristen and I would just like to say a big thank you to the board for this opportunity to serve as student representatives. We've been extremely impressed with the work that has been done this year and feel just really grateful that the board's position this year has been keeping equity on the forefront of all their plans. And we hope to see that in the future as well. Thank you, thank you. That's thanks to you for holding us accountable and helping us with this work and leading this work. Mm -hmm. uh, Crescent Valley High School, uh, Reps Kate Walls and Calvin uh, Kowalski. Okay, uh, so pardon any background noise, we're doing a bit of construction because it's like we're trying to get our house ready to move but, and stuff, but students in cohort A and B are now back at CV full in person for past week and partial in person for the past couple of weeks. And this week has been so exciting. It's like 
it's a very different change of pace. Um, athletes from TV are also enjoying a great season. And the class president and AFB elections have finished up and applications are now open for core council. Uh, speaking of core council, uh, we're hoping to have some sort of senior day for the class 2021. Yet to iron out details, but it's something to potentially look forward to. And also for seniors, graduation is fast approaching. So that's exciting. And it's Teacher Appreciation Week. So huge thanks to all the teachers who have been there for us when we were just black boxes on their screens or just anything else in this chaotic year. And one last thing before I turn it over to Kate. Uh, it's been fun to work with the board this year. Like this is the last meeting I think that we're going to be going to as student representatives. But since I'm an attorney representative, I I'm excited to work with you guys next year as well. So, good stuff. Yes, yes. Um, I couldn't agree more about both the opportunity that the board has given me as a student rep and also our teachers. Teachers have done so much for all of us this year and really got us through this all while getting through it themselves. No teacher has a degree in teaching during pandemic. Uh, they have been both handling that and handling us at the same time. So we just cannot say enough thank yous to our amazing teachers. Um, so after that, I'm gonna move on to a slightly more serious note. As student representatives, we have a duty to represent the needs of our peers. And that means advocating against the proposed half billion dollar statewide budget cut for education. Uh, that. Uh, will stretch far beyond the federal relief funding that is going to temporarily cover it. At this time of transition and difficult adjustments, the last thing students need and school districts need is to be handling budget cuts like this, which mean fewer staff and teachers and less programs and opportunities for students when they need it most. Uh, at our last meeting, we talked about the Corvallis Public Schools Foundation, and they have been incredibly generous, but this proposed cut will decimate the great work they've been doing. And Ultimately, this is a misguided decision from the Joint Ways and Means Committee of the Oregon Legislature. And we wanted to take this opportunity to encourage any community members watching to reach out to our representatives in the Oregon Legislature to ensure that this doesn't come to pass. Please, as students, we are asking the adults here to do what they can, as we are, which is to protect funding for education for the next generation, which is us. And this funding is not only crucial for programs overall, but for the equity work that uh, as you mentioned as well, um, uh, that the district needs to prioritize now and always. And I think we'll be hearing more about the need for equity work tonight and at the next meeting. And then in closing, I do want to acknowledge that this is my last meeting as a student rep. Uh, it's been both this year and last year that I've been a student rep. It has truly been an honor to be included in this body. And I can truly say I've learned so much from my experience. I know Calvin is going to be a great rep next year as he has been this year. <laughs> and also, uh, he will serve well with whoever replaces me, which we will be finding out more about soon with the core council applications. So I also hope to continue to be involved in district activity and advocacy going forward outside of this role. You have not been rid of me yet. Uh, and thank you also to the board members who have been great to work with while I've been a rep. So that's all from CV. Thank you. I want to uh, provide the usual comment, which is uh, uh, we appreciate your input always and your participation, your active participation in the board meeting and boardroom. And as usual, uh, by eight o'clock, uh, you are free to go. But if you want to stick around and uh, that's also OK, uh, please uh, continue to provide the feedback, the questions and participate in the deliberation. Uh, but as a reflection for the year, and as we transition to farewell to students representatives, I want to say uh, thank you. You've shown us the blind spots when we don't see them, and you've shown us uh, the student's lens of uh, how, <coughs> how our decisions policies uh, impact students. So thank you for that. Uh, in some other districts, they do not have any students representatives, and some of them have only one representing the whole uh, district. So having you all uh, represent uh, your high schools and uh, college health program, uh, it has been enriching and helpful and 
I hope uh, one day you decide to run for office and be a city councilor or a school board member or whatever you feel uh, doing to continue contributing to your community and representing your community as you did very effectively uh, as a student throughout for your high school. So thank you very much. And with that, I want to hand it off to uh, Ryan uh, regarding the student representative uh, representatives uh, reports. Uh, sorry, the farewell to student representatives. Yeah, and again, I just want to say thank you for um, your participation this year. Um, again, it was, it's been nice to recently see some of you out in your schools. Um, I saw Calvin not too long ago um, at CV, and I've been able to see uh, Jesse throw the discus. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you all um, in, in your schools moving forward over the next, uh, over the next month, um, which will be, which will be nice because we've had this relationship for the last year where you have shared your experience with us um, learning through this environment and, and um, learning through a pandemic. And so you've taught us things as well, things about how, um, how even when things are challenging, we're still have our commitments, we have our things that are important to us, and we want to be able to speak up on them. So you've shown that um, all along this year, and I really appreciate it, um, and the perspectives that you've brought. So we have certificates for you. Um, in a normal year, I'd have you all come stand next to Sammy and, and I, and we take some photos. We're not going to do that this year, um, obviously, but we will send you uh, your, your recognition in the mail. And again, thank you for, thank you for um, sharing the year with us. Thank you, board members, students, representatives. I saw, I saw that uh, Calvin had a question. Yeah, uh, uh, just, just want to say something. Uh, Jesse put in the chat that she that she didn't realize that it was the last meeting, but uh, she says that it's been fun working with everyone and that it's been good to and stuff. So yeah, she was just echoing the sentiments and I want to make sure she got heard because, yeah. Thanks, Calvin. I appreciate it. And yeah, and, and to you too, Jesse. Thanks for um, yeah, thanks for being with us all year. Any further comments, Lou? And then Therese. Um, thank you all so much for bringing your voices. Um, student leadership is so amazing, and um, you're going to be going on to do great things with what you've learned. I know this uh, from experience. <laughs> and um, appreciate all your work. And I'm wondering, Sammy, if um, we could have an opportunity for Jesse to read their, um, what they put in the chat, that way um, other folk listening in can hear it. Is that okay, Jesse? Absolutely, Jesse, you wanna go for that? Awesome, yeah, I felt really bad. I had no idea this was the last meeting. I've been like very, busy and chaotic, but um, I just wanted to say thank you for allowing me to represent my school. I've never ever done something like this and I was really nervous, especially being alone um, doing it. And also I put in the chat, thank you guys for putting up with my terrible Wi-Fi as well. I know it's very annoying, but um, I'm glad my first experience was with caring and hardworking people. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, thank you. Therese and then Sarah. Therese. Thanks, Sammy. I'm going to try to have my camera on to say this. Um, so first, I just wanted to say always that it's such a, a treat to have students come in. And it's such an important part of the work that we do because you know, I mean, I don't want to say it, but every year I'm further and further from my high school experience and a little further away from really um, the embodied experience of coming through a public school system as a student. So it's really, it's important to have you guys here. Um, this year in particular, I want to thank you because you were, um, you were, you tethered us to spaces and events and activities that we didn't have another way to really participate in. There weren't games to drop in and watch. There weren't concerts to attend in person. Uh, some of the ways that um, we get to really as board um, experience the, uh, the high school, um, the high school activities, we just didn't have those this year. And each, each board meeting you came in and you reminded us that you guys were still living your lives and things were still happening. And despite um, the pandemic's best attempt, you were continuing to move forward in your education and your learning 
um, in extracurriculars, you were resilient beyond uh, beyond words. And um, it was really a very special each meeting to have you in the room and to be reminded of that in ways that um, were different from how we normally would experience that, but were really just very meaningful this year, especially. And with that, I want to say that I, I truly hope that we see all of you in community leadership positions. And before you step out of this role permanently, there are seven people that have watched you participate in um, civic engagement this year, seven volunteer people, staff and administration, of course, have to um, remember us, we will remember you, but remember us when you go forward and you want to put in that scholarship application or you need that letter of recommendation, because we can say some really um, amazing and profound things about your contribution. And we would love to do that. We would love to have a chance to brag about the work we've been able to do with you. So take down our information. Don't walk out of here without knowing how to get in touch with seven people who will be phenomenal recommendations for you when you need them. And um, yeah, so, and if any of you were coming uh, by way of Lynn Benton, it would be a pleasure to have you in class um, and make you co-host and let you maybe even teach a lesson or two. So look for me if you come that way. Um, but again, thanks so much. It's been just a real joy to get to watch all of you grow and um, to get to share in part of your journey through school. So awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, uh, Therese said most of what I wanted to say, but I... I um, have appreciated the perspective and the hard work that you all have brought to the board. Um, this was a year where it was would have been very easy to, to check out and we definitely did not have um, our student reps doing that. You all you worked hard and, and represented your schools well and, and brought us, you know, as Tree said, really critical voices and perspectives at this time when you, even though even though, even if we if we all had been closer to being high school students, we have no idea what it's like to be a high school student in the middle of a pandemic. So um, I just thank you for your hard work and for sticking with it. And you make our school district proud. So thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, oh, Vince. I think Jay raised his hand first. Oh, Jay, I'm sorry. That's okay. I can't get my hand to work. Um, I just wanted to have two comments. If I were writing a letter of rec, nice idea, Therese, words that come to my mind are about you all, are you are very thoughtful, sincere, passionate, energetic, and mature. That's really, and that's saying a lot because we don't always get that, so thank you. Um, I want to add one more thing. Sammy urged you to think about serving on boards. I would urge you to think about working as an educator, maybe a teacher, maybe a school leader. Um, you love schools, obviously, so maybe think about how that might translate. Thank you for your work, though. I'm glad you threw that in, Jay. Amen. <laughs> Vince? So I'm just gonna echo what my colleagues have said and certainly offer on the table on recommendations, but I wanna share a story. So you may or may not know, I work for Oregon School Boards Association. I'm a board trainer. And so I, I interact with boards. What we have here, this arrangement, is not common in Oregon. Most school districts don't have student reps on their school board. And I would say of those who do, very few have many, many students on, on their board. And so I have, from time to time, gotten requests, questions from from boards reaching out saying, how do we do this? How do we bring student voice? Because it's something people are realizing is so important in school board governance now. And I get to share this experience, the experience of having authentic, true, engaged kids in, you know, as a part of the governance process. And I get to explain how powerful that is. And so thank you for bringing your voice to our board. It's not the other way. You know, thank you for the opportunity. Sarah and then Calvin. Uh, Calvin. I just wanna say a one thank you to everyone on board who not only has been willing to work with us and has heard our voices, but as Vince said, not every board has student representatives, let alone student representatives to this magnitude. So just 
thank you to the board for allowing that to even happen in the first place, because it's really something that's so special and it helps the students feel a lot more connected and like our voice is heard. Thank you, thank you. And uh, continue to hold us accountable. Uh, one thought uh, that uh, came up uh, recently that we should uh, inscribe this in a policy. So we have a policy that speaks for student representation. So that would be some work that could be done the next year. Uh, and I look forward to that, uh, Kate. And I'll let Kate to have the last uh, word because we're 20 minutes uh, behind schedule. Uh, Kate? Yes, I will make it brief. Uh, that was actually a hilariously good segue because I was going to say that um, I'm working with uh, other student reps because while this position is rare, there are other people, whether it's one person for their whole district, one person for their one high school in that district, they have different ways of doing it, but there are others of us around the state. Um, and I've been working with them to figure out how we would draft a statewide mandate for student representation on school boards because I think you guys have just highlighted tonight why that is important. And hearing from people like you who have seen what we do is going to be really important as we do that because, um, you know, it's one thing to say you should hear student voice, but it's another thing to hear actual adult board members saying it's important and valuable to hear this because it makes us a better board, not just because it looks good, but because it really helps. So um, I will continue working on that. And it, it's great to hear that you guys have found this helpful because that speaks to why this is really important, both in our district to have an official policy and for the state to have this as, a, as an official thing. Thank you, Kate. All right, with that, I'm going to open the public comments period. And uh, as a reminder, public comments period is open for members of the public to provide uh, their input uh, through uh, signing up. And uh, for those who would like to uh, provide the public input and they did not sign up, you can always email the board by going to the website uh, meet the board on Corral School District website, or you can sign up for the next meeting in June. Uh, and I will read a, a few remarks uh, regarding uh, public comments, and I would like the um, uh, members of the public who will be testifying today to acknowledge uh, hearing those uh, guidelines and then uh, state their name for the record and then start. So the guidelines say speakers may offer objective criticism of district operations and programs, but the board will not hear complaints concerning individual district personnel. Complaints shall be handled in accordance to uh, with board policy KL, which is available online. The board chair has the right to terminate a speaker's privilege of address if, after being called to order, the speaker persists in improper conduct. You will have three minutes to make your comments. The secretary will alert you when you have 30 seconds left when your time is up. And here's a sample of the alert. Following your comments, uh, when your time is up, also you'll hear another uh, tone. Following your comments, uh, the board will have three minutes to ask clarifying questions. And for board members, please uh, raise your virtual hand anytime during uh, the public comments so I know that you have a question. Um, with that, our first public comment is coming from Isabella uh, Medina and Stravia Didipali. Thank you, Sammy. Uh, uh, my name is Stravia and I graduated from Crescent Valley High School in 2015. And my, my name is Isabella Medina and I graduated from Corvallis High School in 2013. Last week, the Corvallis School District announced the formation of a Theater Diversity Advisory Committee, or TDAC. This is an exciting development, but what some may not know is that this process has been entirely driven by recent CSD alumni of color. In June 2020, in the midst of protests, Black and Brown students began sharing their experiences of racism and unfair practices in the Corvallis School District Theater Program. Beginning with 2017 CHS graduate, Brianna Brady, Issues included students of color not being cast in shows or cast in degrading and villainous roles, the use of brown face, the exploitation of student labor, the overuse of adults in school productions and several other concerns. We provided administrative staff with 40 pages of testimony and a proposal for an oversight committee and set of guidelines to promote diversity and equity in the department. 
These guidelines were carefully created from the input and experiences of many alumni of color, specifically to address the ways racism and discrimination took form in the district theaters. We see this process as a template for how marginalized communities can direct programs they have been a part of to improve and reform. TDAC will likely be one of the first, if not the first, public school theater diversity oversight committee in the country and could be a model for other school districts looking to make their theater programs race conscious and equitable. The Theater Diversity Advisory Committee will review plays for upcoming seasons and be part of the production process to ensure casting, costume decisions, and other elements of play production are race conscious. The theater department will now have a stipended equity advocate responsible for ensuring best practices for anti-racist productions. We are still negotiating on final edits to make this committee as empowered as possible, but most professional theater departments do not have anti-racism guidelines in place that are this comprehensive. We recognize that this committee is fortunate to have a district that believes in equity work and we are glad that the district has been willing to create this committee at all. At the same time, we want to bring up some issues that came up during the process of creating TDAC that show the challenges of creating anti-racist change in the school district. We had asked directly for the TDAC guidelines to be published online and for the district to begin staffing the committee in June 2020, 11 months ago. However, the application was announced only last week. For comparison, the school renaming committee was announced in August and completed its work in January. In six months, the school district removed old names, procured a contractor, and completed a committee process. TDAC should have been created just as quickly, but the process was unfortunately quite slow. As the process dragged on, many members of the original team of organizers stopped attending meetings because they were exhausted and felt like the school district just didn't care. We faced long lapses in communication, put downs and threatening emails from the theater department staff and repeated requests to rewrite and soften guidelines, which we agreed to within limits. It's important to acknowledge that it should not be the burden of marginalized communities to make these improvements. And we would love to see more independently motivated changes in the district. But when BIPOC community members do point out changes that need to occur, the district and community should support implementation as swiftly as possible. Had the process begun in earnest, as soon as issues were brought to their attention, the school district could have completed the work in half the time it has taken, especially since organizers did 90% of the work. Instead, this process has revealed that redistributing institutional power in Corvallis is not an easy task, only accomplished when marginalized people take up the burden of ensuring things get done. The Corvallis School District should be a model for progressive anti-racist institutional change in education by continually improving and streamlining these processes. We bring our concerns to the school board today because we care about creating intentional practices around diversity at CSD. We ask that the school board one, support an empowered theater diversity advisory committee and future committees to take anti-racist action in the district. Two, ensure that BIPOC organizers trying to create change have their concerns addressed in a more efficient manner. And three, reevaluate policies and practices to make it easier to correct racism and online harassment perpetrated by staff and school departments. We are um, I would like to, uh, sorry, I would like to just uh, highlight to the uh, guidelines that we need to uh, uh, be strictly talking about programs or operations and uh, the board cannot uh, listen to uh, the specific uh, district personnel uh, complaints or grievances, if that's okay. We understand. Thank you. We are cautiously optimistic that TDAC will make a difference for students in the theater department, but this can only happen if TDAC is an empowered body that actively informs decision making. Anti-racism work as a whole can only be successful if school districts treat it with urgency. While the TDAC guidelines are perfect and there will need to be revisions in days and years to come, we are proud to celebrate this achievement for Corvass and the educational community, educational theater community at large. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Isabella and Saravia. Do we have any questions? Kate? Yeah, so um, I'm also happy with the fact that TDAC exists, but I also share your um, concerns that, you know, it needs to actually be an empowered body. And so I, um, first of all, Stravia, um, I want to say hi, but also um, to both of you, uh, how can students both in the theater program, because I know I personally have a lot of peers and friends who are in the theater program, but students in that and 
students who aren't in the theater program support TDAC in not only doing the work that it needs to do, but uh, like continuing to be empowered and following those guidelines, improving those guidelines going forward. What uh, what would you need from us? What can we do to support, like you were saying, not putting all of the burden on BIPOC organizers? What can we as students do, whether on or off of the advisory committee? I think, well, hi, Kate. Um, I think being part of the advisory committee and just getting people to apply is obviously a great start. But one of the aspects of the guidelines that we included is that there is a mandatory meeting between the advisory committee and students. So at that time, you know, encouraging students to come. If you hear something from someone and they're maybe not comfortable sharing, asking if you can bring that up to TDAC, if you feel like someone has faced racism or any kind of discrimination, um, encouraging them also to come forward. I think that's the most important thing because it's from students themselves who are really going to create long-term change in the theater department and every other school department. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. I just you. quickly reiterate that also this is something that you can do in any part of the school district, not just in the theater department, but anytime that you feel like there need to be changes and improvements, you should feel empowered to make note of those changes, share them with your fellow students and staff, and talk about ways that they can be improved. Because I think this process has showed us that getting together to discuss how to make changes actually can have a result. Wonderful. Thank you very much and have a wonderful uh, rest of your evening, uh, Sabia and Isabella. Next, uh, next speaker is Ke Keona McFadden. And could you uh, state your name uh, for the record and uh, uh, acknowledge that you heard the instructions? Hello. Um, yes, my name is Kainoa McFadden um, and I understand the instructions. Thank you. You may start whenever you're ready. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, well, again, um, my name is Kainoa McFadden, and I am a graduate of Corvallis High School from the year 2020. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. I'd like to offer my support in um, for the Theater diverse, Diversity Advisory Community. Um, my experiences in theater have been in high school, community theater, college, and professionally. I studied the Actors' Equity Union Standards uh, Theater Intimacy Training and how to navigate through the industry as a person of color. Um, the Corrales School District Theater Program in particular has taught me a lot about having a strong work ethic, given me a place to grow into myself as an artist, and assured me to have pride as a theater artist. However, many of these feelings have come to me only retrospectively. The theater program without the current um, TDAC policies, uh, theater policies that we writ, uh, wrote up can be easily lended to unethical power dynamics with those in power being allowed to make decisions with personal bias without having any checks or balances, um, creating a culture that can be hostile. Now, I've never experienced this sort of hostile culture um, at all since graduating from the program. Um, the high school contained some of the most influential moments to my growth as a student person. I was always given the advice to give my all and work as hard as I can, yet I was still learning my limits myself. And I believe I pushed myself far beyond my means. One phrase in particular that was frequently shared in the theater department was, you are always auditioning, and the phrase, everyone is replaceable. Um, these phrases spring constantly in the back of my head during class, rehearsals, while offering free labor for summer theater programs and many other occasions. It affected my ability to concentrate on my studies and also affected my emotional stability. I spent mo much of my time in a role of subservience to those in power, overworking myself and constantly being told that I need to prove my worth. This is accompanied by the fact that many plays were chosen without roles that would be, um, that would be cast to me because of my race and that I would need to convince the powers in charge to choose plays with a role for me in mind. Um, now I've only heard these phrases once in the five years since graduating. Um, Broadway is currently under controversy for following some of the principles that 
for not following some of the principles that we set place in this policy. We spent, um, I just want to encourage everyone um, to uh, implement the policy as it is written in place. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kainoa. Um, any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much uh, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Uh, next, uh, next comment is from Brianna Brady. Brianna, could you state your name for the record and acknowledge if you heard the instructions and after that you may start whenever you're ready. Brianna Brady, heard you and uh, understood. Thank you, you may start whenever you're ready. First, I would like to thank Corvallis High School and the school board for providing me with the education I have today to succeed and propel myself further into my dreams. I am, however, in all honesty, exhausted. About a year ago, I decided it was time to speak up about what I believe was racism and exploitation in the theater department. I knew that it would cause a disturbance in our small town. I expected misinformation, hysteria. I expected pushback to lose friends. I expected to become a villainous. I expected, I believed um, that I absorbed this stereotype that was pushed upon me at the very beginning of my theater career. It caused me to act reckless my first year of college, objectifying myself and allowing it from others. I have since moved on and am no longer anyone's Jezebel, but my own Brianna, a fully fleshed out human worth more than her aesthetic allure and prosperous sex appeal. It may make you uncomfortable to hear that, that at 18, I thought my only worth was my profitable sex appeal. I'm very glad to see how far I've come from that broken young girl, but I'm disappointed. I felt as though I was reached out to I felt as I was reached out to by the parties involved so they could save face. That is a normal small town behavior. And I am unfortunately assured in that as once again, the victims, the alumni of color are expected to fix the problem we had no control over for no compensation, not even the assurance that more kids like us won't get hurt in the future. So please honor the work that was done by the alumni and implement the guidelines of TDAC and its committee. Don't let our work die in vain. Ultimately, I have moved on from this ordeal and would like to be left alone at this point and continue, continue my life outside of Corvallis, but do not let it be lost upon you that I am forever grateful for what I could get out of this experience and even the hard lessons that come with it. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Brianna, for sharing. Any questions for Brianna? See none, see none. Thank you again, Brianna, for sharing your experience and have a good evening. Thank you. Um, Jimbo Ivy, uh, could you state your name and acknowledge uh, the instructions if you heard them? Yes, my name is Jimbo Ivy and I heard and understood the instructions. You may start whenever you're ready. All right, thank you so much for letting me speak tonight. Uh, Saravia invited me to come and talk uh, and support the, the TDAC. Uh, my name is Jimbo Ivey. I'm the theater supervisor for the city of Corvallis Parks and Recreation Department. And uh, I believe it's important to support this work that this amazing community of students and alumni have done in drafting this strong, clear, and wide ranging plan for ensuring that historically marginalized communities feel welcome and wanted in CSD productions. Um, as the theater supervisor of the Majestic, we've gone through um, a similar process over the last two years. Um, when we took over the Majestic in 2015, you know, we inherited a theater that was really um, very much uh, only centered white uh, dominant culture voices. And that tradition continued. And as we were sort of the new tenants of that uh, tradition, uh, the community started calling us out and they started, you know, acknowledging uh, bravely the, the harms that our productions were perpetuating upon the community with things like cultural appropriation and use of accents and white facing and brown facing and, and a lot of the things that these brave students have pointed out 
um, about their experiences. And so that's hard stuff to hear as an organization, as the people who are perpetuating this harm, uh, that you are harming the community by doing what you thought was right, what you had been trained to do by by your, your personal bias and, and background. And so as hard as that was, we only had to imagine how hard it was for our communities to feel that the theater wasn't for them. And so we took up the work of forming a diversity council of people who from historically marginalized communities, both professionals, uh, DEI professionals, and uh, performers and patrons and, and people that were just interested, similar to the process that uh, the TDAC is, is engaging in now. And I can only um, just talk about briefly how important this process has been to the, the success of the Majestic over the last two years. Um, you know, and that the most important thing for the administrators and for the, the theater staff is to listen, is to listen to your community, to, to not be defensive, to engage this work, um, you know, with all of the heart that you put into, you know, everything else you do, because this is critically important to the future of our community and the future of our art form. Over the last uh, year or so since we took up this work, we've had four times as many directors uh, from historically marginalized communities and as, as many new actors from historically marginalized communities. We had our first black director on the main stage at the Majestic, which is a frankly embarrassing thing to say for it being uh, 2020. And the pandemic taught us not only were we not serving historically marginalized communities, but communities with disability and and people that need that weren't able to access our theater uh, during um, our kind of typical operations. And so, please, uh, you know, take this process and 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 have it be something that's functional. Listen to your community and uh, let them, you know, talk to you about accountability. And it's really made a huge difference for the majestic. Thank you. Thank you, Jimbo. Much appreciated. Uh, any questions for our Jimbo? Uh, hey, Jimbo, I have a question. Um, has the um, theater program reached out to the Majestic about their DEA work at all? Um, no. OK, thank you. That's good to know. Thanks. Any further questions? See none. Thank you, Jimbo, and have a wonderful uh, rest of your evening. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Goslow, uh, you're up next. Uh, could you uh, acknowledge if you heard uh, the instructions? And after that, state your name, and you may start to immediately after. I heard the instructions. Can you hear me OK? Good. And um, my name is Becky Goslow, and good evening. I'm a retired teacher. I'm proud that my two children attended Wilson Elementary School. For the last 11 years, my late husband, Bill Goslow, and I volunteered our time and resources to establish a repairing strip of trees and vegetation in front of this school. We did so with the support of the City of Corvallis Arborist, Becky Mersia, School District Personnel Chad from Grounds Department and many other community members. Our purpose was to create a sense of pride and beauty in this school for the students and staff. My request tonight is twofold. First, I ask this strip of landscaping be retained and the scheduled bulldozing be canceled. Instead, I request that irrigation and additional evergreen plants be incorporated to this area. Most of the sidewalk along the satinwood that is slated to be removed already has more than adequate vehicle parking and a wide bike lane. Therefore, vehicles are already more than 10 feet from the sidewalk and established strip. Second, I ask the commission retain the 23 parking spots that are scheduled to be removed from the school parking lot. Wildcat has a high number of parent volunteers, students being transported from other schools, and staff during the school day. Most of the parking spots are utilized. This does not include handicap or time-sensitive parking. By reducing the number of on-site parking spaces, it will negatively impact the adjacent neighborhood and create an unsafe situation for children, both as passengers and walkers. I've heard from many parents, neighbors, and staff that they were unaware of these changes to the landscaping and the parking facility at Wilson. As of yesterday, I am grateful for the on-site dialogue from the response with Kim Patton of 509J, Principal Eric Beasley, David Dodson, Willamette Valley Planning, Teresa Jones, 509J School Board, and Michelle Mazinski, neighbor. 
As a result of this conversation, the school district would be willing to plant additional evergreen shrubs and irrigation in front of the parking lot to comply with the city's screening requirements. Another small area that is under review is 48 feet of school property frontage along Walnut Boulevard. Putting an awkward jog in the sidewalk as proposed creates straight concern, safety concerns and will be more difficult to navigate than the straight sidewalk that exists today. Students walking westbound along Walnut Boulevard use the, ex the existing private internal sidewalk that, ex that extends to Walnut Boulevard before they walk to the intersection of Satinwood to go to school. In conclusion, today you will see volunteers beginning to tidy up the Satinwood strip. Um, yesterday I mowed Wilson Wildcats lawn. The commission wanted to know why the re uh, receptacles were on the sidewalk. It's because volunteers are now pruning and we're moving those all around to make sure that the school is tidy. So we're weeding, we're pruning. Uh, Becky Merge is gonna come help prune one of the red maples. We're spreading bark dust. I ask the commission and I ask you to roll up your sleeves and come join us. The Satinwood Strip received the highest honor the city of Carvalho. Sorry, your time is up, but can you conclude? Conclude, well, I've just got a little piece. First citizen, this award was reflective of the beautification to school grounds based on the countless volunteers, resources of the community and support of 509J. After the meeting, I was asked by Jim Dia, the Kravalska Gazette Times, how I felt about the outcome. My reply was as follows. I feel good about the outcome of tonight's meeting with the Planning Commission. David Dotson, planner, used a word to describe the Satinwood strip that resonated with me, investment. It is an investment of time, resources, volunteers, community. Tonight with the support of Alice Rampton, Mark Vomisil, Eric Beasley, principal, Therese Jones School Board, who actually visited the site twice, most impressive, and countless other community members, we're thankful. We will work extremely hard with Dotson, Planner, and Kim Patton of 509J to honor the bond well, levy. Guys, uh, as I have to cut you because oh. uh, I need to be fair with other public testimony. Uh, however, uh, we have three minutes allocated for questions uh, from the board of student representatives if they choose to. Uh, is there any questions from the board? Uh, Therese, do you have a question? I wonder if we might yield our time for questions and allow her to finish her statement. All right. Sounds good, Becky, you may proceed. Okay. As a team, we hope to be a model to the community working if it takes trust together. It takes trust and communication. As part of the outcome, we will be holding a town's meeting to share with those interested in knowing more about Wilson Elementary School Wildcat facility, Satinwood Strip parking lot drain pond. The date and time will be, to, will be arranged. That'll be set by Eric Beasley, the principal, and we will be meeting at the Wildcat Garden area. Everyone is welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Becky. And I apologize. I have to be fair with the three minutes. Oh, no, that's fine. I get it. I get it. Everybody, uh, any other further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Becky. I uh, appreciate your input and your uh, service. Uh, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Great. Uh, next next up is Pallavi um, Dagat. And Pallavi, uh, could you? Uh, uh, acknowledge if you heard uh, the <coughs> instructions, and if you yes. did, state your name for the record, and you may start right away. I have heard the instructions. My name is Pallavi Taget, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair and members of the <coughs> administration. I am first and foremost the mom of a 10-year-old who attends Husky Elementary School. I'm also a professor of electrical engineering at Oregon State University and have served as the president of the largest professional organization worldwide in my field of expertise. I'm here today to talk about the decision to not offer math education to elementary school students at competency levels above their grade level, above their grade standards. I bring with me a perspective that of an educator and a professional, so broader than that of a mom who's only interested in the interests of her son. America has long been heralded as the place for scientific and technological innovations. These innovations we do not have to look far to see, from the app that we are using to connect with our friends and families to teach our children during the pandemic, to the science that has enabled the vaccines that has benefiting the American citizens, as well as people world over. The decision to not offer math education that befits the level and the aptitude of our first through 50, 
fifth graders is denying them the opportunity to grow to their fullest potential. It is like asking America to hit pause, to sit still while the rest of the world catches up instead of moving forward, making the advances that make our world a better place, people's lives better, and world a cleaner place. If we do not give them the opportunity, the bright kids, the opportunity to move forward with advance with the math that they are capable of, we are killing their interest in math even before they have nurtured, we have nurtured it. Boredom is hard. It'll destroy their interest in mathematics and not give them the opportunity to be the leaders and the innovators, the educators that we need in the STEM field. It runs counter to the discussions that are happening in the US Congress to invest in STEM like now, like never before in the past. My ask today is that I understand that the board must have some reason, some rationale for why it made the decision to not make mathematics be available to our students at the level that they are capable of, which may be beyond their grade standards, to share with us, the parents, the stakeholders, what that rationale is. We would like to work with you to make sure that all of our children have the opportunity to receive an education that enables them to grow, to meet their potential as future of this country. And that, in that, I would ask that you engage us with an openness and a fairness and communicate the decisions with us before implementing them. Thank you. Thank you, Pallavi. And I think we might talk about this a little bit, but you uh, might need to leave earlier. Uh, do we have your information, your email with uh, Parker? Is that correct? Yes, I believe we have. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Pallavi? Calvin? Um, so, I can't, it's not a question, but I suppose like, well, it's sort of a question. Uh, I kind of want to like echo the state, the sentiment because uh, I know kids who are above their grade level and I myself was above my grade level math when I was in elementary. And I think that it's necessary that there is work done on this because sure the board has probably had some rationale, but I think there should be something good for that. And so I also echo that, that maybe the board at least makes their rationale known as to why that is the case that uh, above grade level math is not offered for kids in elementary school. And yeah, that's all. Appreciate the comment, Calvin. Thank you. Kate, do you have a question? Yeah, I just uh, question in the sense that um, I, would also question perhaps the rationale for doing this because I also have concerns about high schoolers math. I know I was in AP Calc this year and I will be taking AP Stat next year and that's because I got ahead in math in elementary school that I was able to take these AP classes that are often gateways to higher education which you also <laughs> I'm sure know a lot about as well and so I just want to echo that not only are you cutting kids off from moving up in elementary school but if I hadn't been allowed to do that I would not be in AP math classes now because that allowed me to escalate to ascend the ladder of math early and that's what we have to do to take AP classes because of the way that math is structured in high school so I want to ask the board to consider the ripple effects of such a decision on secondary level math education because being able to skip grades or ascend grades in math in elementary school allows us to take honors and AP math classes in high school, which allows us to go into those fields, get experience, get internships, get into the colleges we want to. And that starts, believe it or not, in elementary school. I just wanna emphasize the importance of this and um, thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you, Pallavi. And uh, please tune into the uh, live stream uh, afterwards uh, uh, for the continued discussion about this. Uh, uh, we might have some comments about it. Um, and thank you and have a wonderful rest of your, your evening. Uh, next you. up is, thank you. Uh, next up is Natasha uh, Maletti, and I apologize if I did not pronounce your last name correctly. Um, uh, could you uh, state uh, uh, that you acknowledge the instructions and then state your name for the record and you may start immediately after. No worries, Sammy. Uh, my name is Natasha Mallet, and I did hear the instructions and I understand them. Hello. I am a mom, an educator, and a professional engineer, and I will soon have two kids in Corvallis schools. I come today not because I need opportunities for my kids, 
but for other students, especially those from identities underrepresented in STEM education and careers. I strongly believe our schools should have equitable, equitable systems. I strongly believe our education has some structural inequities, particularly in the areas of history, textbooks, who has a voice in education, and now apparently theater. In terms of math education, I strongly believe eliminating math education opportunities for everyone is the wrong approach to addressing these structural issues. In fact, limiting access and opportunity is a foundation of white supremacy. The district seems to be misinterpreting how math opportunity in elementary school would lead to inequities later on. The research agrees with eliminating lower level math courses, quote unquote lower level, but anti-racist principles do not agree with eliminating opportunities for some students to work at a different rate or progress through the curriculum in different paths. For example, think of a young Katherine Johnson, the former NASA mathematician of Hidden Figures fame. Would you deny her the opportunity to work ahead in math progression or move around differently if she showed interest and motivation? I mean, no, that would obviously be unjust. Adults deciding to hold students back even if at grade level is what the stride dismantling, dismantling racism reflection tool that was sent to all, all teachers in the district identifies as a white supremacist concept. I see math tracking, quote unquote tracking, not as an equity issue, but in, as an inclusion issue. A strong and fair math curriculum is important to improving the inclusion of underrepresented groups in STEM, including BIPOC, LGBTQ and women specifically um, there's a wide body of research that shows the elementary and middle school ages are formative for girls' perception of math and strongly correlated with later interests and outcomes. If we are eliminating math opportunity at these ages, the research is clear that girls' participation in math will decrease in high school and therefore college and STEM careers. It's easy to identify programs such as advanced placement or math tracking as part of the problem because as implemented, they have historically served and catered to white high-income children and deciding to just eliminate those programs altogether without considering the unintended consequences is also easy. Instead, I push the district to ask harder questions. How do we offer opportunities to motivated students in an anti-racist way consistent with district goals? How do we create inclusion in these programs by dismantling existing barriers? And which factors help these barriers persist? Unfortunately, this requires focus and resources in a space that has been historically steeped in privilege. But if we aren't asking these questions and creating change in these spaces, then we're preserving power and privilege for those that already have it and not shifting power and opportunities to students who need them. Thank you so much for taking my comments and all your continued work for all the students in Corvallis schools. Thank you, Natasha, I appreciate it. Any clarifying questions in ITSC, Jay? Uh, thank you, Natasha. <clears throat> Could you, I think I heard you say, or you could just send us a copy of what you just read. But did you say something about something was distributed to teachers? I couldn't understand what you said. Um, I mean, it was sent to me by someone else. Um, I heard all the teachers got a copy of it, or maybe they're planning to get a copy of it. There's a, a stride report. It's called um, Dismantling Racism in Mathematics Education. Okay, thank you. And I can, I can send, I mean, I can send that to the board if you want as well, which it's a reflection tool. I think it's, it's a great tool. A lot of, so I teach engineering at Oregon State and a lot of the same concepts um, that I reflect upon in my teaching is in there, right? There's, they don't use the word meritocracy, but it's in there. There's lots of these things. I think, you know, when we talk around issues around equity, they're complex and sometimes the easy ways can actually do more harm than good. And that's my concern with this math education change. Thank you. Thanks, um, Natasha. I really appreciate your inputs and comments. Uh, Kate, do you have a question? Yeah, I know we're like super over time, so I'm just going to like keep it really brief. I know I, um, I just want to, in a sense, also echo that in that I know that the district has been working on getting more people involved in AP courses, not eliminating AP courses. And I think the same logic applies to getting more people involved in higher level math at younger ages. It's not about, um, because, you know, research has shown that, yes, underprivileged populations are underrepresented in those things, but eliminating those opportunities doesn't help anyone. It And it also allows people who have resources at home to accelerate, get further ahead. And it doesn't give the idea of public schools a chance to work in that advancement. So um, 
I just want to echo that again. And also, um, yeah, just, you know, as someone who got put in that, just, is it equitable the way it is? No, but is the solution saying that no one can get advanced at all because it's unequitably distributed as it is? I don't think that's the solution either. I think to be anti-racist and um, dismantle all of these systems, we have to be thoughtful. And I really appreciate public commenters coming in and emphasizing that. Thank you, appreciate it. So um, I, uh, with that, uh, I want to uh, thank you, Natasha, uh, for your input and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Uh, and before we move to the next uh, public comment, uh, I want to highlight uh, maybe uh, Ryan, if you want to briefly talk about this. Uh, I know that the board wasn't uh, did not deliberate on this subject before, but maybe you can give us a, a highlight on it. We have one more public comment, so okay, I wonder if we that. should do that first. All right, yeah. Okay, probably let's do that better. Uh, so Jen Adler, uh, Jen, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Awesome. So could you acknowledge that you heard the instructions? And if you did, uh, state your name for the record, and you may start immediately after. Uh, yes, I uh, acknowledge and understand. Um, my name's Jen Adler. And um, gosh, you know, listening to Kate, I think she has expressed my comments better than I can myself. Um, we, you know, we we're all sort of in agreement that marginalized students are underrepresented in accelerated programs, both math and otherwise. Um, I have my own personal experiences in the, um, the selection processes for uh, um, programs at the math and, uh, sorry, at the elementary and early middle school levels um, and, and felt as though it was flawed in some areas and that biases did in fact exist. Um, let's make a plan to fix this. Um, we, we also have students that develop at different rates and maybe shouldn't be pigeonholed into one track or another beginning at the end of the elementary school level or the beginning of middle school. Um, again, let's come up with a plan to address this. These are solvable issues. I'm here on this call tonight, despite my intense fear of public speaking, um, because I've heard that there is a plan to eliminate accelerated programs uh, instead of fixing them. But I, I really feel like this plan is addressing the symptoms, the systemic systems without identifying the causes. And um, I learned a long time ago that correlation is not necessarily causation. Um, and though I truly believe that um, we're all well-intended. Um, as, a, as a parent of a BIPOC and a TAG student within the district, I believe we can do more to service, to serve historically marginalized students, but I don't believe that removing accelerated math opportunities is the answer. So I do have a question for you all tonight. Um, do students within pro proportionally underrepresented populations agree that the continued reduction and elimination of accelerated programs is going to help further their own education. Uh, what percentage of those within our district who identify as students of color, students questioning their sexual or gender identity, students who have IEPs, free and reduced lunches, who qualify for OHP, or those that are um, first generation high school diploma seekers, uh, how many of them actually want leadership to eliminate these opportunities? Um, I'm curious because my own son checks off these boxes as well as being a former uh, theater participant. Uh, he wasn't asked about his experiences. And um, when I explained what was happening, he doesn't understand how this is gonna help. Um, when I helped him register for classes um, for next fall, he told me that while he knows he has a choice to take advanced or honors classes, He's just not interested in taking them. And in his words, he said, why take an honors class um, when you can, um, for, the, you know, for the same credit, you, you just don't have to do any extra work. Yeah, so, uh, time is up. Can you uh, and, and this semester, and, um, and honestly, against his will, he's begun getting tutored by a ninth grader. She's a DACA student who is in AP classes. And I wonder if she supports the elimination of accelerated classes and wonder how this well-meaning decision might affect her and her opportunities. Um, so my request is this, and although it kind of makes my skin crawl to say this, please send 
out another survey. Send us a survey. Um, allow all historically marginalized students and not just those who represent them an opportunity to share their thoughts on the causes of this gap before, before finalizing a decision either way. Find out how important school is to them. Find out if they wanna get what they want to get out of school and find out if they think that this will, eliminating these programs will help. I have to uh, stop you, I'm sorry, because your time is up and I apologize for doing that, but- No we problem. Have, uh, for allocated for questions if uh, board members choose to. Is there any clarifying questions from board members? All right, uh, Jen, with that said, I want to thank you very much for your input and uh, and uh, uh, public testimony. And uh, uh, Calvin, what's your question? Uh, could it be moved that we allocate like a minute or so of the question, potential question time for her to finish her closing remarks? Sure, uh, Jen, you have one minute. Well, um, thanks for the minute, but actually I my last uh, line was just that um, I just urge you to send out a, a survey, a Google poll, and, and that um, I wonder if the data that you get back might surprise you. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Much appreciation, Jen, for sharing your inputs and, uh, and speaking up to today. Um, with that, uh, have a wonderful rest of your evening and have a good night. Uh, with that, Ryan, uh, we heard a lot about the math tracking, and mm -hmm. I've heard it from community members uh, as well uh, in the past uh, few weeks. Uh, uh, we have a busy agenda, but maybe if you can give us an outline, uh, what is it and maybe how can we know, learn more about it? Yeah, so um, we've um, been working primarily the teaching and learning department, thinking about um, both ways of um, hearing from families and also sharing some information about um, how we're doing in math and some of the research behind that. So look for additional information. We've been, um, you know, we've been um, we've been talking about it for a while. At the same time, we've been trying to move through this pandemic, mm -hmm. um, and so we're at a point now where we're ready to um, continue that engagement in that conversation. And so it is something we're looking into the best um, best methods of doing that. So we'll we'll be providing additional information as we move along. Um, but as of now, that's that's sort of where we're at. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and I believe that's it for the public comments. So seeing there's no further uh, public comments, the public comments period is now closed. And with that, I want to, um, and I, yes, it's uh, 8.09. So Calvin, thank you very much. And anyone who wants to uh, lead from our students' representatives, feel free to do so, but you may stick around if you want to. Therese? Sammy, uh, first, for those of you that are leaving, thank you so much for joining this evening and remember to remember to get our information. Um, I'm wondering if this might be a good moment to um, pause for a, a short bathroom break before we jump into what I think are some longer sections of our agenda. Uh, is there any objection for that? And I think my uh, 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 sundown for it to break my fast happening soon. So. Uh, how do you feel about 10 minutes? Is that okay with everybody? All right, we will uh, break for 10 minutes until 8.20. Thank you and have a good night to rest.
Folks, we're at 8.20 and we are reconvening for the school board meeting. I want to note something. I just did the math with uh, how much time we have and the agenda we have. It's a busy agenda um, already and uh, we're on time to finish at 11.15 if we keep the pace. So just keep that in mind uh, as we ask the questions um, and uh, provide comments. That, uh, that's, that's where we're at. I'll try to move us along but also give us time to deliberate and ask questions uh, as necessary. And for things that are first read, uh, make sure that uh, you can uh, share that with staff uh, offline as well. Uh, so with that, uh, do we have all board members here uh, available? I believe so. And um, Mark, the next item on the agenda is Muddy Creek Charter School Annual Report. Uh, and we have Mark Page, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, if you want to introduce yourself, and I understand you have a presentation. Yeah, my name's uh, Mark Page. I'm the interim executive director at Muddy Creek this year, um, or at least for part of the year. And I do have a presentation I'd like to share with you. All right. Is that fine? Absolutely. Okay, let's see if I could share my screen here correctly. Okay. Um, so I, I think you can see my screen. Is that correct? Um, actually, let me see if I could put it to full screen. It might be a little better. There we go. Minimize that. Okay. So um, I won't go through the vision and mission. Um, you, I believe, you've all been shared this report um, earlier. So um, this is the mission vision. Um, what was really interesting is what drew me to the school actually to, um, to come this year and help them out was the idea of place-based education, which to me, um, I find to be very progressive. And I've not seen that in my um, going around the world, looking at different schools and working in different schools. So that was really an attractive um, thing about it. Uh, a brief historical perspective of the school it was founded in 2008. It was previously... Uh, I believe a neighborhood school inside the Corbella School District. Um, and they created a charter, like I said, in 2008. It's a K-5 school. Um, it's servicing the um, Beaver Creek and Muddy Creek watershed area. And it also includes uh, many students from Philomath, Moreau, and the Albany School Districts, as well as Corvallis. Um, it is a place-based curriculum. That is the main objective of the school. Um, being a rural community um, with many farms surrounding it and also uh, nature um, preserves, that's kind of been, you know, what their strength has been is utilizing these community relationships in regards to that. Also, they try to um, do uh, multidisciplinary um, education um, where, you know, they're obviously um, merging all the different subjects um, incorporating that with the place-based education as much as they can. Um, they also have a, um, a very, you know, one of their strengths is to utilize art and science um, interwoven into the core curriculum. That's something they're very proud of. And they have lots of uh, partnerships with the uh, local landowners and some of the agencies around, for example, 4-H and um, OSU. Um, there are objective is to make sure that the students are on track with um, going on to their um, feeder schools and also within the Corvallis School District and to be able to move within other districts as well. That's obviously, you know, something, a goal that they always have. Um, and we have a very, very good working relationship with 509J. As far as employees go, um, it is a K-5 school. Um, we have blended classrooms in two, three, and four, five. Um, each classroom has an instructional assistant. We also offer uh, 0.5 PE and art instruction as well. Um, we currently, for the administrative staff, we have the executive director, a tech director, facilities manager, and an administrative assistant. Um, this year is a change for us in that we're subcontracting out our financial management. And um, what else we have here? Um, we also have quite a bit of help in regards from the district um, for SPED, 
Um, we also have our own behavior management, um, our behavior support specialist, I should say. And we also have a special um, teacher for um, disabled students. The literacy program, I'm gonna go through the three. Um, it's very structured. Um, you know, I'm new to the school, so I'm actually learning the, um, what their program actually consists of, but they are very heavy on reading and literacy, as you can see from some of the bullet points here. Um, I do know for assessment, they are using DRA, or at least they did when they were in person um, at the beginning or the end of last year before COVID really hit. And we currently started a new program for us anyway, which is Lexicor. And I believe it's used within the Corvallis School District quite a bit. And so that's new to us. For math, um, we're using bridges um, for K-5. Um, obviously, um, there's a strong emphasis on Kagan structures actually across all subject areas, but that's one thing that um, I've been trying to push at since I've been here for the last few months. Also within science, um, this is kind of like their repertoire of expertise. They have many, like I said previously, they have many arrangements with the farms um, and also with the nature preserves nearby like Finley. And um, they do a lot of work with them. Also they have um, a very strong relationship with 4-H. And also um, they didn't do it this year. It's been postponed, but the season tracker program I heard is uh, very, it's, you know, it's a really nice program that they work with. Um, for specialists, we currently have, um, well, they previously weren't very tech um, oriented in the past, but now due to COVID, we have a one-to-one -one program. Uh, we do have a 0.5 tech integrationist. Um, and so my goal is to um, work with the tech integrationists and to really uh, use technology in a more authentic way. They were really kind of, it was really thrust upon them with, when COVID hit. And so they've been making do with what they could do. Um, I think that's a real strong point going forward for them is to actually utilize that tech across all the subject areas, like I said, in a more authentic way. Also, um, we've just recently adopted the ISTE NETS um, standards for students. Um, which is actually based here out of, out of Oregon. Um, in regards to library, we have a 0.5 librarian who also integrates um, lessons into all the classrooms. And as mandated by the state, um, we have PE Health also. And we just um, rehired an art integration teacher who works across um, all the grade levels. Okay, for assessment, um, we have not done any assessments this year, as you're probably all well aware, um, in regards to the Smarter Balance. Um, we'll, I predict we'll be finding out about that shortly if we will be doing it this year. But currently, um, what I have up here is the previous results from the SBA. Um, community engagement. This is one of the strong points of the school in the past. Um, they had a very strong PTO presence and community involvement. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, it's kind of taken a back seat. However, we've been utilizing technology the best we can to keep it alive. Um, we do newsletters, uh, monthly board reports, um, and actually the board meetings we've been having, it seems like at least one board meeting a week to deal with a lot of the issues that we've been um, having um, this year, which I'll get to in a second. Also, we have scheduled town hall meetings. We've already had one since I've been here. It was very successful, uh, a way for the community to voice their um, concerns with us and interests. Now for COVID, this is the interesting uh, aspect of the school, and I'm not really sure if any of you are aware of what's been going on at our school, but we've had essentially 100% uh, turnover in staff. That includes instructional staff and support staff, um, and there's been a lot of, um, turmoil at the school, I guess you can say in regards to that. And I believe from my, um, experience from other schools and from what I've learned about this school, a lot of it, I believe, um, came about due to COVID, um, and the stress and anxiety that, um, has come about because of that. Um, the work conditions for teachers has been extremely difficult. Um, um, in my opinion, it's, uh, almost unattainable, um, what is required of teachers and how to teach currently. 
um, but they've been doing a really good job. Um, we do now have a new staff that's very eager and uh, energetic, and I'm giving them as much support as possible in moving forward, and it seems to be working. Um, I believe that everything is stabilized. I've been getting a lot of support from the district. Uh, Melissa, um, who is in the meeting currently, um, and many others in the district has been very, very helpful. Also, I must state that the um, Muddy Creek board has been amazing. Hands down, one of the best boards that I've ever worked with. Um, they unwavering their, their commitment to the school and supporting me in getting uh, stabilizing the school and moving forward. Now, we have not sent out our climate surveys yet. We're currently in talks to get that done um, relatively soon. But from the feedback that I have been getting from parents in regards to communications that I've had with them, it's been very positive um, what the parents are saying about the school and the direction that we are going. Future endeavors. Um, I've already started planning with the staff to move and the board to move forward with uh, getting the school back on track. There are, we have a five point initiative, four points of which come from or originate from the mission and vision, um, which are place-based education, um, moving more towards a standards-based uh, assessment and in, in planning, uh, integration of an agriculture-based uh, programs that are vetted by the state, uh, to bring us back, that's also kind of tied in with the place-based education, uh, and also reestablishment of the community uh, building, you know, components of our school, um, which obviously we couldn't do during COVID, but that's a main focus next year. Um, the final point is, once again, um, referring back to the technology, and now that we have a one-to-one -one program, I feel this is an opportune moment for this school to really learn how to incorporate it into uh, the core curriculum um, and, and really utilize it to its uh, fullest. Um, the school improvement targets that we have outlined, um, actually one of them's already been done, which was a seismic rehab for the facilities um, that's been done. We have two major uh, facility projects that we still need to get done uh, probably in the next year or two, which will be the replacement of our covered area and which was we had to take down due to the seismic work that was done and also the blacktop replacement, which are two hefty uh, financial burdens on our school, but we hope to get that done soon. Um, also professional development change. I've already implemented a different, uh, or I should say a differentiated professional development model where teachers actually get to choose uh, where they want to uh, improve their practice and we will support them in that. Um, also, we plan to use the integrationists more in regards to training of the teachers in regards to the specialties that they, um, they're specialized in. And finally, to end it, um, student educational experiences. Um, you know, uh, we're planning next year in the fall, obviously, like you guys have stated, to go back full time. And we're planning that that's actually going to happen. Obviously, we know that anything can happen uh, over the summer. Uh, but our plan is to move forward with full time. And um, also we're planning on uh, revisiting the um, curriculum, the adopted curriculum for the core subjects um, on a annual review process um, that we'll set up. Because right now I believe we do not have that. As far as the presentation go, that's, that, that's it. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, any questions for Mark? Lou, and then Vince? And, and before the questions, maybe I'm sorry. Um, if it's okay, um, Melissa's been working closely with Mark, so there might be questions that Melissa wants to um, add on to as well. So as you as you're thinking about those questions, board members, that would be my suggestion. Sounds good. All right, Luke. Thank um, thank you, Mark, for um, sharing the report. Um, looks like some really great things happening, and I did have a question. Um, I know that the vision has been around for a while, um, but it says that it has a program um, with its community. It says the land and its people. And I think from like an indigenous perspective that lands a certain type of way. And so I'm wondering if um, there is any work with the tribal programs um, using that terminology. And if not, that could be something to possibly think about. Um, I know that the tribes in the area have a lot of great connections with the lands and um, there's some land-based 
um, materials out there, even like some of the stuff they do at the Mary's Peak Alliance and stuff like that. And so thinking about some of those kind of place things that incorporate tribal um, perspectives as well. Um, it was just like a kind of question comment. You don't have to like dive into it, but I was just a little curious if there are any connections so far. Yeah, well, um, I'm actually not 100% from this area. Um, so I've just come in. Uh, I've been living overseas for quite a long time. Um, I, I actually am a little bit aware of some of the Native American, um, you know, goings on uh, in the history, but as far as the school is concerned, um, I haven't seen anything in our program that directly addresses that. Um, as far as I know, um, I don't, I really can't comment on it because I really don't know because I've just been here for a few months. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Something to think about perhaps. Definitely, for sure. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the Corvallis School Board. Yeah, thank you. Good to have you there at Muddy Creek. Um, you know, I really love this little school and I love what it, the work that they do. Um, and I know that this has been a really troubling time for the school. And so you raised some uh, really uh, some disquieting things that happened. I mean, one is the, the shift in leadership. The other is uh, the really dramatic turnover in the uh, in the staff. And then the other is the you uh, the apparent departure of the of the finance director or whoever was doing finance. I'm just is there a plan and, and maybe Melissa, you can speak to this or both of you can speak to the uh, just the overall stability of the organization. Um, and it's just and the health of the organization going forward. I don't, Melissa, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a it's a hard question. To throw at me, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know that. I, I know that um, in that interim period when Muddy Creek was operating um, without an, an executive director, that their board was um, was really taking action. They were um, very responsive and were um, extremely concerned about ensuring that the students that are there. Um, came back next year, and um, how could they make sure that they're recruiting more students to come into uh, come to Muddy Creek? So, um, and you know, all of that, the money that flows through to Muddy Creek is ADMW. So we know that having right. students and having a, a solid student uh, enrollment is going to be important to their financial security. So um, then I would turn to Mark. I know you're in the midst of enroll re enrollment and registration, and so um, he maybe could talk to what he's seeing as far as kids wanting to come back and families staying. Yeah, so there's a few points that um, kind of touch on that, Vince, um, and the rest of the board. <laughs> um, number one is the financial health of the school, the budget. I've been working, we do have a contracted um, financial manager now, and she is amazing, Our, you know, her organization. She actually works with private and charter schools in particular, and so she really has a lot of knowledge of how these schools operate, and, um, you know, I've been working with her and also with... Um, Karen Steele, who's on the board, um, who deals with the finances for this um, in regards to the board. And our budget is very healthy going forward. I've been, um, you know, we've been working on it uh, for the last month at least uh, for next year's budget. And it's very healthy. As far as enrollment, we just finished the enrollment for next year. Um, we're following along with Corvallis um, on how you guys, on your timeline. And we have more than enough students. We have more students wanting to come in than we have available slots. Um, uh, and interesting issues, the board, once again, itself, the board is very strong and cohesive. Um, it, the, really the only concern that the board has brought forth and, um, that I've kind of been thinking a lot about is retention of the teachers, obviously, because we had such a high turnover. Um, and I've never seen that ever before in a school. And, uh, um, with that being said, we do, we are going to lose some teachers next year, but it's due to just life issues, you know, like people are just moving on. So it's a very normal thing, I believe going, going forward, we already have started the process for hiring. And we've also, the board has agreed to um, change our pay scale in order to perhaps, and I know very well that pay is only one small aspect of having people happy in an organization. However, we are making it a little bit more equitable um, are closer to what um, Corvallis has 
And we believe that that will help in retentions of teachers going forward. Great, thank you for that answer. It's all very satisfying, thank you. All right, well, Mark, thank you. I'm uh, sorry to cut it short, but I really appreciate your presentation and the report. Oh, Teresa, your hands are up. So let's do one more question from Therese and uh, then we'll move forward. Uh, Therese? Sammy, my question is something that I think will be a, can someone get back to us on this? So it shouldn't add too much time. So um, Mark, welcome. And we're glad to have you um, here virtually with us. And um, maybe sometime soon we'll be able to actually be in the same room. Um, so my question is really something to, for maybe some forward thinking for you uh, to respond back to later being relatively new to Muddy Creek. Uh, the last time that we actually had a chance to talk with Muddy Creek in person, which I now can't even remember when that was. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, we had a conversation about the enrollment processes and some steps that the community was looking to take to increase the um, diversity of who could access Muddy Creek um, in terms of the student population. And so we had, I had hoped that there would be an opportunity sometime not too long after that to get a kind of a report out about what the school had been able to do to, um, if they had done, if they had been able to make any progress in terms of brainstorming ways to make the, um, mostly the distance I think of, of Muddy Creek um, more accessible, um, but also to increase the outreach so that families that don't necessarily know to look for it might find a way to hear about it and be able to be, um, you know, consider it for their families. And so I'm curious to know, uh, particularly with all the turnover, um, where, um, what's the energy level at Muddy Creek right now for trying to reach some of those harder to reach communities um, of students, students around. Um, and again, if you don't have a lot to say about that right now, that's okay. Um, just want to put that out there as something that we uh, continue to think about for our greater community. Sure. And, and once again, you know, equity and, and that's a big topic in this, every state now in the United States. And that is definitely on the front burner of our school as well. However, we are also are just trying to keep our heads above water. We have a lot of new staff and we're just trying to learn our jobs. Um, for example, we had no office manager for two weeks. Um, and obviously there was no interim director either for two months. And so we're just trying to, you know, learn. And we lost a lot of organizational intelligence, um, our knowledge. Um, in the departure of the previous staff. With that being said though, the new staff is very young, very tech savvy. We're using social media to promote the school on it, far more than the school's ever done before. Um, also in regards to outreach and getting um, populations of students, because distance, our school is really far away from Corvallis. I mean, it's eight miles, it's not easy to get there. Um, so what we've done is we are paying are actually I think you guys are paying <laughs> for busing for us. Um, and so we are, you know, we've dedicated that amount of money um, that has been allotted to us for busing to ensure that we maintain those bus routes to the furthest reaches that we can possibly go and still have it manageable um, in regards to time of students sitting on a bus in order to bring in those people who do want to come in from, you know, further out. So it's promotion on social media and providing transportation for those families who don't have uh, transportation to get to us. So those are two things that we are definitely doing currently. And you know, we're always looking for ideas on how to improve uh, you know, access to our school. But right now um, we feel that's, you know, it, was, it was a big cha uh, challenge just to get the busing done, especially in COVID, right? That was very difficult, but we got it done and we're very proud of that. Um, but yeah, in our social media. Uh, thanks, well, thank you. I really, I'm oh, sorry. I appreciate the recognition of the loss of institutional knowledge, organizational knowledge. Um, and I think that can't be overstated how impactful that can be. So thank you. Yeah. I, I would just like to add one thing, if I may. Um, losing the institutional knowledge was a major setback for the school, but I also see it as also a major benefit. Um, not having previous procedures and policies that were set in place allows us to have a clean slate to really think and look at our practices on how we run this school. And rest assured, this staff, they're very energetic and we are very eager to um, service the population of Corvallis in our watershed district and even the families outside that. 
Um, we're very eager and we're very enthusiastic about um, our mission and vision. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. And uh, uh, thank you, Melissa, for your uh, uh, closed work with Muddy Creek and uh, the support. Uh, looking forward for more progress on, on this. Thank you. Take care. Uh, next item on the agenda is the bond program update. Uh, and we have Dale and Kim here. Uh, just as a reminder, today we do have only our reports because we're, there is a very uh, um, heavy and exciting work to uh, have next month. So next month we'll have a presentation, but you have a report and uh, Dale and Kim are available for questions uh, or comments. I want to just take a pause and highlight a few things from the first page of the reports. This is the third year anniversary of passing the bond. So three years ago, the voters told us with a uh, landslide margin around 67%, we need to uh, do this work. And uh, since then, uh, the uh, district has done a tremendous job uh, bringing about 30% of the budget, uh, in addition to the budget, in terms of money is because of uh, matching funds, <laughs> premiums, accurate interest. And that's a testimony of a really good stewardship mm -hmm. from the district. Uh, that's $60 million that uh, the Corvallis School District uh, was able to bring in uh, to manage risk and do the work and deliver on the promise. Uh, that uh, could have not been done without uh, solid leadership. So really thank you on that. And uh, also I want to highlight another thing, the financial activity on the bond in the next uh, six months will increase six times uh, than what we had the last three years. So that's exciting. And we're looking forward to uh, see that coming our way. So really thank you for this work and uh, um, more exciting work ahead of us. Uh, with that, uh, I wanna open it up for my colleagues, uh, board members, uh, for any questions or comments. And we have Vince. So I went to Spathe Lumber and they they wanted to sell me a two by four for $15. And then I just had a friend of mine um, tell me that he got all in charge almost $80 for a sheet of plywood. So this makes me really nervous with <laughs> the construction project. Crystal ball time, Dale and Kim. Uh, how are our wood products prices? What's driving this first? And how's that going to impact the bond project? And do we have sufficient reserves to deal with in these fluctuations? I'll, I'll take a shot at that. The, the lumber market is not unlike other markets, but it's, it's probably the most visible. And a lot of production facilities were impacted by COVID and that alone has driven up prices. And at the same time, the, the market is kind of recovering um, starting earlier this year. And that's driving up demand, which is driving up prices. Oh, so I, I think see. it's kind of a double whammy there, loss of production and increase in demand all at the same time. Um, <clears throat> the good news is our bigger projects are mostly framed out of, out of steel, which has not been impacted quite as much um, in terms of escalation. There's been some, and I've, I think I've even talked about that before. Um, we usually build escalation into our budgets and estimates so that we're prepared ahead of time um, for those impacts. Um, the smaller projects um, are, are framed with wood. Um, the ones that are that are um, uh, behind us, Garfield mostly, that was bought pre pre increase. Um, Jaguar and, and Wildcat, we'll see some some impacts from that, but we're we're budgeted for it. Um, okay, and for the projects that are yet to come, we are still being conservative in our in our budgets, like we have been all along. Um, and as and as Sammy mentioned, the the effect of the additional bond reserves has been, uh, you know, very important to the success of the projects, so. Got it, thanks. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? So, so next month we will have a sort of a midpoint um, presentation. Uh, feels it's funny to say that, that we're sort of at the midpoint, but we're at the midpoint. So. It will be an opportunity to hear uh, a more in-depth presentation for sure. Exciting. Lou, you have a question? I was just wondering how this week has gone with the fuller return of students and traffic and everything. 
Things still going all nice and smooth? Um, I'll take that one. Yes, we did a lot of prep with our um, construction teams and administrators at those schools that have construction happening. And we have had success. Pretty smooth week. That's great. Okay. Good. Awesome. So with that, uh, thank you, team. I uh, really appreciate your hard work and looking forward for the midpoint uh, next month. Uh, with that, let's move on to state summative assistance recommendation. Uh, Ryan, you do have a recommendation regarding the state uh, summative test, uh, assessments. We do. And um, both Amy and Nikki are here um, also to help to present the information tonight um, and also um, give it sort of an overview of where um, the recommendation comes from, as well as that um, the input we received through our survey. Um, we did a parent survey um, to help us to come forward with the recommendation. Um, so that is where we are right now. So we're gonna just go ahead and start with that presentation and anticipate that the board will have questions as we get to the end. And Harper, are you driving or are? All right. I think. Hi, everyone. It's Amy Leeson, Elementary Teaching and Learning Coordinator. And? And I'm here, Nikki, Secondary Schools Teaching and Learning Coordinator. All right. And we are going to work with Parker. Thanks, Parker. So we wanted to start tonight um, to just talk a little bit about assessments in general. I think when we say we're not, we're, we, we have this ultimate recommendation that this spring um, to not do the smarter balance assessment. Understanding that there are multiple assessments that we are doing and have been doing all along, I think is real critical. And so one of the things we wanted to point out was just some different types of assessment that we've been using throughout the pandemic and that we use all, all the time. Good teachers are doing assessments all the time. There's um, the, the four that are on the slide are for probably the more common types of assessment that we talk about, uh, diagnostic, uh, formative, summative, and benchmark. And um, you have some of this in your report. There's some details here, so I'll give you just a minute to look at that. I'm not a fan of reading slides, but, but basically we're continuing to do diagnostic, formative, and some types of summative assessments throughout this time. Nikki, anything you want to add? No, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I just think that um, our teachers, as Amy shared, have been doing assessments throughout the pandemic um, and they're continuing to do those performance-based assessments in our elective classes like world language and choir and band, standards-based assessments in our math and science classes, a lot of work sample assessments in language arts. Um, and social studies, and then teachers are continued, continuing to um, create real world learning projects um, across all subject areas. And so those are ways that our teachers can understand kind of where our students are now compared to where they were when they began the year and help us get ready to serve them in the beginning of next school year. Yeah, I think the important thing um, is to think about what we're using it for and what we're doing right now. Like we use those assessments right now to guide our instruction and to guide teaching and to be thinking about how, um, how, what, how, what my lesson design is gonna be. We don't necessarily use the summative assessments to guide any sort of our instruction right here and now. So thanks Parker, you can go. So in addition to um, a variety of assessment types, we also look at different kinds of data at our school to help understand how our students are doing. And so we look at attendance data, beha behavior data in our student support team meetings. We will be administering the Youth Truth Survey. I think our first school goes on Friday. Um, and then many of our secondary schools, I think are a couple weeks later. Um, and then at the secondary level, we also look at grades. At high school, we are always tracking whether students are earning those six credits per, per your school year and on track to graduate, and then overall credits earned as well. 
I think um, Nick, you mentioned that the student service teams are meeting. They have been meeting all along and those teams at our school level will be helping determine who's coming to summer school, who needs summer support. And so they have data that they're looking at and they're continuing to do that and use those to guide where we're going now. All right. So before we go on to this yeah. piece, uh, I just want to sort of reiterate the, the, the concept here, which is that um, the information that teachers are using um, to inform their, dis, their um, instruction are things that people will continue to have. What we're saying is that the, the SBAC test is a summative test that gives us information long after if this year it won't even have percentiles because of the number of kids that are taking it. So in terms of the information teachers need to have to be able to instruct um, the students in their classrooms, that information is still available to them. And we're spending our time with students in classrooms and using those tools that help us to help kids um, as they move along, rather than something that, cut, that takes away time that doesn't give us that information this year. Um, one of the reasons why we don't have percentiles is just the number of students taking it across the state. Um, and so, and we don't have a comparison from the year before. So those are the kinds of um, issues that are, uh, are around SBAC this year. Um, and that's why we're asking for the, um, the recommendation is the postponement this year. Yeah, I think, Ryan, the other important thing is that as every fall, we start off the year with finding out where our kids are. And so that's not going to change. We have assessments planned already for the fall. We have a process we've used in the past. We'll, we'll be looking at that and more as soon as we have kids in, our, in, in front of us in September. Okay. <laughs> So oh, we, yeah. Okay. I'll go ahead. Yeah. So we sent out a survey to our families and we, you can see um, what our response was like. And we just, we weren't really asking them yes or no, but we wanted to gauge opinion from the community before bringing this recommendation to the, to the board to postpone the Smarter Balanced Assessment. And so you can see the results from that survey on the next slide. And what you see here is a pretty overwhelming response toward postponing where that it was five is like, I, I strongly support postponing um, the assessments until the next school year. We do still, um, you know, we, as Amy and I both shared, we have a variety of assessments that we use to understand, um, to, to just better know our students. We also are planning to spend some time while we're in person administering the Youth Truth Survey, which tells us a lot about student experiences and student perceptions. They have modified the survey this year um, in light of the pandemic. So it should provide us some, some good data about how our students are doing. Um, so we can serve, truly serve like the whole child and be thinking about the data that's coming in from our classrooms, but also their perception data um, that they share through Youth Truth. And I think it's also just kind of important to note that this is information we won't, wouldn't necessarily get through those formative assessments um, through, our, through the um, curriculums that we're using in the class. And so this is a piece that we felt like we still wouldn't have um, as much information around um, as we think about the social emotional needs, the school connectedness components, those other aspects of being a student in a school. Um, and you've all seen that data um, a couple of years ago now because um, it was scheduled last year right when we um, closed. Um, so we did postpone that last year. Um, but I do think that it's something that we would still want to continue because it is different information um, than what we would have otherwise. So I think you have our report and, and this slide I think is the last one. And we have um, a little bit of time for questions and answers um, before we move on. Amy, 
uh, until I see everybody, I want to ask her quickly, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the fall assessment and what is it, what does it measure and how does it compare to ISPAC? So we have, we'll have multiple assessments that'll happen in the fall, depending on grade level and curriculum and, and, um, and uh, school level. One that the benchmark assessment that I noted at the bottom is our STAR assessment. And that um, it gives us a chance. It's similar to a summative, but it it's, can also be super meaty. So depending on how much we can dig into that, we can get some individual data. We can get some really good big picture data from that too. Like, of all of our second graders, here's how many second graders we're worried about that are not even close to reading at grade level. And so then we can think about our resources and what does that mean and, and how are we going to, to, to work about our day um, based on how many kiddos that we see across the grade level, across the classroom. And, um, and usually we give those, we give a little bit of time for kids to settle in. It's not usually the first thing we want to do when we see a kiddo in the fall, but we'll have that data pretty pretty right away and and definitely be using that does that help sammy yeah and I, i'm just reflecting it's more reflective of where the students are as they begin the year than where the were before a summer drop uh, basically for, right for it gives the data the comparison all the norm data is based on fall of that school year so it's a first grader in the fall here's some norm data to tell you what what's typical what we would expect what we're worried about so, yeah. Thank you, Jay. So I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> I can understand that time is important in class for the last six weeks. Can you tell us how much time at what levels would be asked of students to take these tests in these six weeks? It, it depends on the student. I would say I would not expect it to be less than an hour and a half um, at the very minimum for the a, a content area, probably closer to, to two hours per content area. And we don't do that all at once. So that's not like you're just gonna sit down. So it's just one day and you go in for two hours and you're done. Um, it's, it's usually done over multiple, multiple days and their stamina, stamina that we look at and um, multiple other factors besides just that student time. But that's, if you're just talking about just a test, potentially that's our best guess. We don't know, we haven't seen it yet. And- um, Well, in, in your experience, give me some examples of let's say third grade, what, does every grade take two hours or five hours or 10 hours. So, so they, um, per, per test is that per student per test. So and at, what, at what grade? I mean, I, don't, I read your letter and to be okay. blunt, I don't think it was a fair letter because I don't think it told parents how much time are you going to spend with my child doing assessment? So if you told me as a parent, I'll spend 20 hours on testing, I would say, Ooh, that's too much. But if you said, I'll spend three hours on testing in the next six weeks, I would say, oh, that might change my answer. Your, your letter doesn't say that. So I'm, I'm asking you to help us understand how much time generally are we asking students to be testing instead of taking instruction? So it would, be, I, um, it would be about two hours um, per student because it's gonna be one content area um, this year, either reading, right, reading math or science. Um, it varies a little bit content area to content area, and it varies a little bit from student to student. Um, the other piece that um, to keep in mind is there's also um, some training that staff will have to do um, in order to administer that test um, that they would need to do as well. And so, and what I would say, Jay, is that we're not saying that we're not assessing kids, we're just not assessing kids with this assessment. Um, and, I just, and, I, and I just think it might be a distinction out of what I heard you say, um, because you said um, kids would be testing three hours or six hours or 20 hours, and there will be an assessment that kids are involved in, regardless of if we do this or not. And that time's not incorporated into that response from me. And so, Jay, so I think the other thing, sorry. Is it's more, it's not just 
the time to take the test is the only reason we're making this recommendation. So th there are multiple factors that are leading us to think that, yeah, that. So yes, we don't wanna waste the little bit of time we have in person with our kiddos doing a standardized formal test. The, the other really big reason is that the outcome data that we're gonna get from this is not going to be usable for us in a way that we would use it every other year. It's that this, when Ryan mentioned that we're not gonna have any norm data, we're not gonna have the percentile data, even the students who take it, you don't have, we won't have that reference for how this compares to them for other years. And with the amount of anxiety that always goes into these tests, even as much as we want to be calm about it, knowing that that kiddo is doing their ultimate on, on this when we're living in a pandemic is also data that we're not, I don't think any of us would take and, and, and be able to use. But I, I hear you saying, I hear you saying percentile data because we, we don't have a number of districts in the state to compare to. But then you said there's no norm data can't you compare to other years? My under, oh, sorry, Amy, if you want to answer it, but my understanding the test is uh, it has been differentiated from previous years. It's a, is that true? To a new test, is that right? Yeah, so the other thing I was going to mention is this year's test is not the same. It's shorter and it will look different. So we can't even, like, it's just not going to be a comparable test. Okay, my last question, sorry, but this is, this is I mean, to me, we have gone through an amazing year and in any sort of evaluation, it would be good to know what, if any, deficits and where we have. And I think what you've said is we will know what deficits based upon teacher analysis in the classroom. Um, they do their own assessments. They can share with the next teacher up the level that they got to or whatever. And, and so, number one, do we have time set aside for teachers to talk to each other about how far I didn't get in history or didn't get in language arts or didn't get math, question one. And then two, tell me again about the STAR benchmark testing, who all takes that in the fall? Because I think that may be a great solution to say, how, how deep are we if, if there's a hole in math or in reading? Who all can, who's gonna get those kind of benchmark tests? Uh, all of our kindergarten through eighth grade students. Okay, that's powerful. So um, I'll look for Vince, Lahui, uh, Therese, and then Sarah. So didn't, didn't you have a second part to that question? Oh, oh about right. time. And that's the purpose of that, um, that PLC time um, for those th things that happen as well as the SST. In the fall or in the spring? It's all year long. Okay, so that's that's a target. We could say, hey, we're having teachers talk more perhaps this year than ever. How far am I getting my my group of kids for the next class? That's built. In, that has been built in over time. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's go to this. So thank you for answering one of my questions, which was really the utility of this uh, uh, patched SBAC model that it's not gonna be comparable to previous years, it won't be comparable to subsequent years. And so uh, as a tool for the board to hold our overall system accountable, it really has no utility. And what I'm hearing from staff is that it doesn't have utility uh, for educators in the classroom. And so it that really recommends against it. The Where I really wanna go is a point that Jay raised which is okay, so I know from a board member's perspective, this year has been kind of a black box from an assessment standpoint. Uh, and so I know that we're all eager to get a really good understanding of what the, uh, what are the learning progress landscape looks like in our district. What information are, are you going to be able to pull from this year that you can bring to the board, like in a summer retreat, that we can really, you know, sit with for a while and get a deeper understanding of what the needs of our district is um, looking forward. And then, and then we'll get that second shot when, when you deploy STAR, we'll get results in the winter and we'll have a much better sense of, of where we're headed. Is that, is what I described something that's, that's realistic? a realistic expression, expectation for this board? I think at the secondary level, um, grades and on-track data will be worth looking at um, for middle school looking at grades. And then 
looking at the data, the on-track data for high school is going to be pretty valuable. I also think looking at who is in our summer programs and, and where they're spread out, looking at the de demographics of our summer program participants, I think is also going to be telling of, of what we're seeing and who is going to need some additional support over the summer. And just, I mean, and some of that is just relearning the routines of learning in person. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is our the reason why we're still pushing for some youth truth data is thinking about what matters and how do we get kids in a place where they are able to learn. I think knowing where social emotionally our kids are is going to be our critical first step in finding out what we even do at the beginning of the year. So knowing you know, actually I'm, 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 I'm doing okay through this pandemic or this was awful. And we have this, you know, a whole grade level that is suffering more than others. And, and it's going to make us approach instruction maybe a little bit differently. So I will say any data that we have, we'll be filtering through and looking at and, and using that to help guide a kickoff. And then we'll also figure out what, what important data we can, we can filter to the board. Yeah, I'd say first, don't mistake my silence on youth truth as as not being interested. I did. It's just implicit that that's a priority for this board. It has been consistently. Um, I guess the the only comment I would say is that just be prepared to walk with this board. I mean, you're going to be presenting data that's going to be really different, probably than what we've seen in the past, and helping us navigate that and make sense of that is going to be really important. We're going to need staff support to do that. So uh, thank you. And next up is Lou and then Teresa. Um, Vince actually asked one of my questions, which was about like what kind of information we'll see from the data from a board level. And I um, just wanted to underline that that is something we'd be interested in. Also knowing that um, we're not the ones developing the curriculum plans based on the, that data. And so knowing that that's the most useful for the teachers who are actually doing the work with the students, um, I think my question is more um, if you can clarify for just the um, the community that the the um, sorry it's getting late <laughs> I'm losing my words I need more coffee um, that the assessment that is being done already that has been being done is something that has been guiding um, where students need to or where they need to go next year and where they're at already. Is that the same kind of assessment that's going on now that you're talking about doing? And um, the other thing is, I appreciate you bringing in data to back a conversation about data too, like showing that survey I think was really helpful from parents um, as well. So thanks for using data about data. And I hope my question made sense too, because like I said, I'm a little bit off at the moment right now. <laughs> Yeah, so if I heard you, like the, the information that we're collecting now this spring is helping guide teachers now and we'll use that same information to help teachers of the next class in the fall. And yeah. that, that's for sure happening. Um, okay. And that's way more useful than um, the other numbers. And some of those numbers get asterisked out as is right now, right? Yeah. Would yeah. Those, would that be yeah. Does. So this feels like in those instances that these this data is way more useful to implement what needs to happen next year with the um, where students are and where they to help them get to where they need to be. Yeah, sometimes it's tricky to use even end of year data to help where we start the year because so much happens over a summer. And okay. so I'm often, I, it's good data to go into with, but I always, I always recommend that we start the fall with a, a fresh set of data to see what happens. You know, maybe a kid learned to read over the summer and we're using old information. So I, it, it's really good that we're continually doing this and that we'll start the year off with really finding out where our kiddos are. And I think the only other, thank you. And I think the only other question is this is not having the assessments is not going to hurt any students for like their future plans, like for college or um, for um, vocational school or anything like that, right? This like those numbers aren't even in the equation. Yeah, um, ODE has already said we're not using this data. That's not being. It's not a requirement for our eleventh graders, and so we're we are we're good with that. And there's not going to be any detrimental effect for a kiddo not taking it this spring. 
Thanks so much. I just want to also just add on to what Amy said, you know, like our teachers are constantly responding to, to the, the data that they get from student and students and whether that is straight from an assessment or from looking at engagement. So today, um, when I was meeting with high school principals, I asked them to share a highlight and one said, it, you know, we're, we almost have our first tiny home complete. So they had students that were disengaged during remote learning that were, were coming in and building a tiny home and doing math and doing construction and learning real skills. And that's like, that's nothing like SBAC. And it's pretty amazing that that's the kind of response that our teachers are giving to our students when they realize there is a need for engagement and support. And, and, and it's like, you're not gonna see that on a test score, but that students came back and have been engaged. And it's a brand new project for that teacher. Like they saw a need and said, this is what I'm gonna do. And this is how I'm going to serve students. And I believe in our staff to do that. Thanks for bringing that example. And that's a really, um, really powerful story. And I appreciate that really intentional work going into like assessing where students are and looking at like, there are other ways to do that here locally and so thanks for all your all's hard work on that. Thank you and then next is Therese and then Sarah and after Sarah I'm going to entertain a motion or a decision. Therese. Thanks Sammy. A lot of things that I was curious about have already been asked so I'd like to talk about the survey that you sent out to parents and the response rate. I'm curious um, you know you send surveys out to parents before and there's a pretty overwhelming difference in the response on, on this survey regarding how many parents said we'd really be very fine with not having testing. What is it like eight, was it 898? I don't have the slide in front of me, but anyway, so my first question is how does the response rate on this survey compare to response rates you, you've had on other surveys you've sent out to parents? I'd say it's um, pretty a, a, a thousand respondents is probably pretty common for us. Okay. Um, to be honest, I, I'd say that's probably within the, the range we tend to typically get. Okay. And how many families do we have in our district? Ballpark? Well, we have 6,700 students. Um, so we probably have close to 4,000 4, families. So that's like, 25% then of your student of your, that's like, that's a really great response rate. So, um, so uh, really, I think I can probably leave my, I, I don't think I need to ask any more questions about that. That's really huge. And I don't think the survey is giving you any gray areas about what parents think on this topic. And I don't, I can say as a parent, when I got that survey, we absolutely talked about how much time might be spent on testing. So just to to Jay's question earlier, I'm guessing if my family talked about this, other parents talked about um, what they thought would be the pros and cons based on how much they th how much time they thought would take. I can tell you in my house when we answered, it would not have made one difference to us to know if it was one hour or 15 hours because we were responding based on what we thought was going to be um, an unnecessary psychological stressor and further interruption to the social emotional opportunities that returning to school provided, which made the return to school and the potential uh, implications of COVID numbers in our county worth it to go ahead and take that risk, not to have him sit alone and take a test. Um, so I, you're probably figuring out where I landed on that um, survey. <laughs> um, but uh, I, um, so I just, I have more confidence that the survey was probably thought through by parents before they put down an answer. I think that your numbers they're very telling. I don't even know that you need to hear what the board thinks because 898 parents out of, you know, what, 1100 that responded, they told you what they think. And that's a, that's a overwhelming majority. So thank you for sending it out. I appreciate the attempt at including the community in moving forward in it. And I, when the opportunity comes, I'm going to be happy to tell you to use your time doing something else. Sarah. Yeah, um, thank you for bringing this to us. And as soon as the survey went out, I the anxiety and questions among parents, yeah, I was hearing things from parents immediately. Um, and really you can answer these questions with yes or no, if that's all you have to say, but these are the things that people were, were worried about as they were asked 
as they were answering the survey was one, are we going to know where kids are when we start school next year? Yes, and. Okay. Yes, and find out more. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so, and, and sort of following that, and will, will teachers have the information they need to serve the students as they, you know, as we finish this year, we start out next year? Yeah, I think the, the beauty of our timing is this is what we do. This is what we do in September. Mm. Ask what we do is we find out where our kids are. What do they know? What do they not know? What do they like? What are, and, and so we're going to use that to help guide us just like we always do. And the gaps might be a lot bigger than we've seen in the past, but we have systems in place to start to deal with that. So the good thing is that doesn't feel unfamiliar to us, that mm. this is what we do and we're pretty good at it. So we're ready to get back into a routine of, of finding out what our kids know and can do and then, and then bridging the gap. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, you know, I think that was the, the real concern that parents were having was it, this, there was sort of a conflict between we don't want to take the time to do testing and we're so worried about this last year, what it's done to our kids. And we want to make sure that you know, we're able to really figure that out. And so I think, you know, I'm confident with what you're telling me that, um, that it was, this is what teachers do. Um, we, we will know where our kids are and what holes need to be, be filled. Um, and we can use the time that they have in school this year to, for them to be together because the last thing they need to do is sit in front of a computer and take a test because that's, I can see the anger that would happen in my house if that was what was happening at school one day. So um, thank you. And chair would like to entertain a motion if there is any. Vince, what's your motion? I move to authorize the district staff to maximize instructional time by not administering state assessments for the 2020-21 school year. Second. Second. I think it was Therese, am I right? Therese has it. I'm not competitive, Sammy. You can give it to Sarah if you want. <laughs> you Either. Therese is seconded. And uh, uh, any, uh, any deliberation, and I would like to deliberate actually, or maybe clarify, my understanding, this is that this is for the good of the district. This is big for the good of the students, the good of this for the staff and our teachers to do what's right in terms of focusing on care and connection, processing trauma, processing needs, and uh, and maybe uh, reflecting on the growth that's happened, the unmeasurable growth. There's no rule, rule lure or assessment, I believe, maybe youth through, but there's no assessment that has been designed to measure the growth of our students over the past year and a half. And I feel there are tools that our teachers are developing that will help that measure it and process it and be able to be ready for the summer and the fall to learn. Uh, also, I'm convinced that the, the assessments and the uh, diversity of assessments that uh, we saw in the first one, first or second slide, uh, gives us a better understanding of the system. Uh, as an instrumentation uh, systems engineer, uh, I know what it means to have only one sensor at one part of the process. And I'll be honest, SVAC is a faulty, uncalibrated sensor that's going to give us data that cannot be tracked with the past. And uh, Actually, it's not, I, I'm not gonna call it redundant because uh, what I heard from what we're doing, we're, we're doing much more work. It's not redundant to the other work. It's uh, less quality, less resolution. Um, the sampling is not right. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's for the common good of the students. But also I want to clarify, and sorry, I usually have to abide by, we ask questions before the motion, but uh, Ryan, could you clarify if, if I am a parent from the other end, from number one, and I come in and I say SVAC is the best thing for my kid, I want them to sign up. If this motion passes, how are we navigating that with that parent? Is there an indication? Is there a response? 
Yeah, so I think what we would do is have a conversation with that parent. And if they're adamant that their child should take it, then we would find a way to provide it for them. Um, what we're asking is that the, um, the standard would be that we're not doing it across the board, but if there's a specific request, we're gonna, we're gonna meet that request. At the same time, there's a lot of other information that we have that we can use that will give us the information we need. Um, it was when Sarah was asking those questions to Amy, um, I was also thinking, um, and, and when Amy would say yes and, and I was thinking, and SBAC doesn't do anything more to enhance that and. It does, you know, it doesn't further that. Um, at the same time, if that request came forward, we would um, do our best to honor it. Wonderful. Well, um, yes, Jay. So a question or, or comment that I would make regarding trying to understand what impact, because I trust our teachers and administrators that given a regular situation, we're going to do well. And mom and dad, you have to help us and student has to help us. Um, I can only imagine that if I were a parent right now, I would be very nervous about how much my child did not gain during this year. So I would also say, I don't want to build on the anxiety. I, I hear uh, Sarah in your comment that, that, yeah, that makes, I, I don't like anxiety. On the other hand, I also want to know where my child is. So my question goes specifically, the tests that are offered K-8 early in the year, when would we get back data that tells us how they're doing or how they, where they are? How quickly, is it three or four months or is it weeks? No, it's pretty immediate data. It's, we will have it in our hands that day. Like however long it takes us to process and test, it's our data, it's our system, we implement it, we set the timelines. It's, it's not a state directed system. It's something we've chosen to purchase and use in our system. And, and like any test, it's got its limits. Be careful about what you judge. But do we share that material with parents very quickly or what do we do with it? In, or what do you plan to do with it next fall? We typically share it at some points. It's really, we've talked a lot about our PLC teams, our student service team, our student study teams, our, our, our RTI process. That's the kind of data that we look at across the board to, to help us to help determine how second grade is doing. So we, we take that data and we look at it across a classroom, across a grade level, across a school, and we, we do a lot of fun data work. So my, my final point, mm -hmm. I will be voting in favor of this, but I will have big assurance <coughs> in my heart that number one, we will share with all our disaggregated groups because I have a feeling that there's an equity problem here that a lot of students who did not have support at home may not, may, may be further behind than we want. And then secondly, that, that we, we use it as a way to say, trust us parents, we're not gonna hide our performance your performance as parents and your child's performance, we're gonna use it as a tool to build on. But if we're, if we're playing that we can't afford to look at it because, oh my, they might think badly of us, bad idea. So that's my, I would support it. Thank you, Jay. Um, Sarah, Vince, and then Lou, and then Therese, and uh, let's keep it to a minute to two minutes max per uh, uh, board member. Sarah? No, I just keep forgetting to put my hand down. Okay, Vince. <laughs> No, I'm looking forward to voting for the motion because SBAC, even when it was prior to the pandemic, was a marginal measure for system outcomes, uh, particularly for our district at high school levels because so many students opt out. Um, so, Sammy, you spoke to this point really well. Um, I don't think that, that investing in it now, it doesn't help children and it's not going to help the board understand things. We got a commitment from our staff that they will help us navigate the variety of different ways that that educators are measuring the the growth of our children currently and have been over this year and so i'm feeling very confident going into next year and we get star data fairly frequently from this staff um, it's that it's that green blue yellow red zone data that we get and it's very high resolution very handy very nimble um Lahui and then Therese. I should have wrote it down because it's that time of night, but um, I just wanted to um, add in that as far as finding out where students are, that we also get 
a different type of grade report for a lot of students this year. Like we're getting a more full understanding of where exactly students, where our, um, where our kids are as far as what where their learning is happening or not happening. And so I think that that kind of um, that kind of assessment that's happening helps me see it a little bit better than I would see it on a state test where the numbers are lost, like an individual level, like this is exactly where my child is. And I think that's really helpful um, for thinking about, I was thinking about what Jay was asking in particular about like how will parents know where their students are. That's one way um, is through those kind of um, assessments that are going out. But what I was going to ask is um, there's no funding repercussions on the district for not participating. And I think that's really important for the community to know, like, where it's not like our funding is going to get lowered or taken away or anything for not participating in this. And I, that didn't come up yet. And I thought it was a really good point for community to know. Thank you, Lou Therese. Thanks, Sammy. I just want to um, <clears throat> affirm that our educators and our administrators, uh, I, I, I think this is a vote of confidence that they know what they're doing, that they have all along known the best way to get information about our children's learning and what needs to take place in the classroom. And for our community who has expressed repeatedly confidence over this last year about the teachers, we trust the teachers, we believe the teachers have been doing a really great job yeah, this hasn't been ideal, but man, the teachers are our heroes. I think we have to show up for them tonight and we have to vote in favor of this request on the part of the district to back our teachers and to back our administrators that their leadership has been everything that community-wide we have been preaching that it has been since the pandemic started. If we don't vote for that this evening, it will be really difficult for us to walk out there and say, yeah, this whole year we've been saying that our teachers are the glue holding this together. This is our chance to come forward, make sure that our community knows that our board listens to our administration. We listen to our teachers and they're sending us a very clear message that this is not in the this is not a tool that they need to serve our children well. So um, I'm gonna vote for it. And thank you so much for putting our kids first, for listening to your staff and for uh, coming out and sharing something that um, is, not, is a challenging topic. Talking about standardized testing is not ever an easy thing, but I think it was really brave of you to say, we don't think this is the thing that our district should spend time on. And so thank you and, and I, you have my support. Thanks. Director Jones has inspired me. I recall the previous question. All right. Without objection, uh, the uh, question, the, floor, the motion on the floor is to authorize district staff to maximize instructional time by not administering state assessments for the 2020-21 school year. Um, signify your vote by uh, a, a, aye or nay. Uh, Director Adams? Aye. Director Conroy? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. aye. Director White Bear? Aye. Vice Chair Finger McDonald? Aye. Chair Adropo votes aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, team, uh, for answering our questions and for the report. That has been very informative. And uh, I look forward to sharing this discussion with the uh, community members as well, because this is very informative. And I believe we're doing the right decision at the right, uh, the right time. Thank you. Thanks. So now next up is uh, the first read. There is no action required for the first read uh, regarding the racial educational equity policy, uh, FKA, replacing educational equity revision. And we have Marcian here. And uh, I want to thank Ryan and Marcian for this work and uh, the leadership on this work. The school board has committed to anti-racism and racial equity. Uh, over this year, we have focused in our professional development and involvement and engagement on this work. And uh, this is getting into the conclusion of this process. However, the beginning of a very important work uh, for years to come. So with that, I wanna uh, open it up. Uh, Marcian, Ryan, is there anything you would like to share uh, at the beginning before we enter into discussion? Um, yeah, just that this has been a, a year long process. If you think about the work that happened with Kristen Miles starting in August um, and throughout this year to get to this point, 
to provide a draft policy that NRCM has then been able to take out and share with communities um, and come back to you. Uh, I just want you to kind of have maintain that perspective as we talk through it tonight. Um, it's it's more than a um, policy written by OSBA for adoption. It's um, transformational and it has um, received input from a number of a number of stakeholders. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marcia. Yes, and thank you, everybody. It's such an honor to be here. And I, as I was. Uh, um, logging into Zoom, I was reflecting on when we first started talking about um, the, our, our work together with uh, racial equity back in September and what a year it has been. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time throughout the year talking about the why and the importance of having racial equity at the center of this policy. We spent some time talking about some historical perspectives, and then we really tried to tie this racial equity policy to your other board goal, which is community engagement. And so for me, this has been an honor. It's been an incredibly humbling experience to reach out to our community and ask for their perspectives and their voice in this um, document. And again, it's not a document with words. It really does represent our community. And so in the board packet, I uh, shared the different focus groups that I've met with throughout the last couple of months. And I'm just really looking forward to having you um, go through the document. And um, again, just really honoring the perspectives our, of our community. So thank you again for allowing me to be here with you tonight. Thank you, Marcian. Um, any comments or discussion uh, in this? Marcian, I think you touched on the, the motion that I felt as I was reading through this. Um, I was deeply humbled. Um, the document has grown past what anything that I could conceive on my own. Um, it certainly has transcended all the example policies that we looked at. It, and it's something that's, you, it's even hard to see what our original, pol our original policy in this. It has grown, words escape me. It's large, it's powerful, it's compelling. I remember saying that our policy needed to state why, and it goes so far beyond just saying the why, but it, it really states so clearly what our core values are. And I'm just, um, I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of this process. And I really, um, I look forward to championing this, this policy going forward. I just um, echo what Vin said, like you could, this really reads like that there's community involvement in it. It doesn't feel like it's just something that was written by one or two people. It feels like there's investment in it by multiple people in that process of getting that information. Um, thank you, Marcianne, for leading that work because being able to spend time to hear some of what was shared about the policy and the suggestions is really powerful. And you can see that reflected here. And um, it's like Vince said, it's grown so much from that first draft and it's just amazing to see that. Um, the only like addition suggestion is on number 11 is that we put gender expression. If we can start including that language in our policies, that would be great instead of just gender identity. Um, that's a comment I have for another policy as well. But I really, really just appreciate seeing how strong that this is and how much um, it brings in some of the gap areas that we missed, right? Like we missed that part about pulling in student voice when I'm like, how do we not put it, that in there? We know it's, we know, we want the student voice and this is for the students, but we didn't specifically list them as being part of, um, as part of the, I'm looking at number nine um, on that one. And so bringing in, I think having that student input really helps strengthen it because this is who it's for, it's for the students and for them to bring their voices in is really awesome. So thank you. And I'm really excited about this. Sarah and then Therese, and then uh, Jane. Yeah, I, you know, this is a really powerful thought when I was reading it, it was how we have a lot of work to do. And I like that it 
gives us work to do. Um, I also really appreciate that we, we work so hard as a board to set goals. And now I see a lot of those goals that are now written in our policy, which yeah. gives them strength and longevity in our district. And I think that's, that's really, um, and I, you know, I, I just, the voices you can hear through the, the pieces of this policy. And yesterday, Sammy and I met with students and the things they were saying is reflected in this policy. And so I think it's, it becomes a really powerful document in the way that it embraces the real concerns and the real steps that need to be taken and takes or aspirations and puts them into things that now we are required to do by policy. So thank you. Therese and then Jay, and then I'll recognize myself. Uh, <coughs> Thanks, Sammy. Uh, I just have, um, it was just a really profound experience to read this policy and to, in so many ways, look at it and think, well, what was the original policy? And how did we think the original policy was going to get the job done after seeing this one? Um, my, what I love about that though, this is what I love about it is that that's what this equity work is. And I think that what I so appreciate about the thoughts that went into the first policy is that and the people who spent the time to write that are not even a little bit upset that the policy has been improved upon, that it has been in many ways really functionally gutted and built into something that much more reflects our community. And I, I appreciate that leadership from the people who put this in front of our community in the first place. And then those who came and said, no, you didn't get this quite right. And the people who took up the mantle to say, let's make it better. And I want to pay um, my respects and my gratitude in advance for the people who I hope in a couple of years come back and point out to us what we still didn't get right so that we can continue to make it better because equity will be an ever moving target to, um, you know, to really reach that. And so thank you for all of the staff um, support. I didn't have any wording in it that really stood out to me as problematic. But I have to confess, I probably need to read it again because I think I was just so awestruck the first time going through that um, I probably do want to make sure I don't want to wordsmith. But just really on my end, nothing but but gratitude for our community and for the participants. And could this become the way that we do our policy? Could we make sure that we we not only expand the voices that are included, but we name the voices that are included? Because later, some people may realize that people got left out of that conversation. And if we're not transparent about who was part of it and was instrumental, it will be hard to know who whose voices need to be, you know, part of, of revisions and rewrites and, and recasting that vision for the next group. So um, yay, and let's keep doing it because it, it's policies iterative. So thank you. Thank you, Therese. Jay? <clears throat> so this is a big, big, undertaking issue that school, in my experience, has wrestled with for about six years, I think. Um, Vince, you talked about maybe two years prior to me coming on the board, you had worked with the prior board to develop the equity policy. Um, and that then this takes, and you use the words, Therese, I think, functionally guts that equity policy and changes it to a, quote, racially or racial equity policy. So I wanna walk you back through the wording and then ask to maybe rethink. Up in paragraph one, in the black ink, we use the word student identity. I'm sorry, my, it's so hard to work with. Um, including racial identity. <clears throat> so the, right at the bottom, it says when, um, the original paragraph says, we will achieve equity when student identity does not predict or determine success in school. I think that's a strong statement. What we change in the rest of this is we don't add that including racial, we just call it racial identity. And so I don't know totally, um, with great respect, Marcianne, who you talk to, but I think there are a lot of people who would say that language is 
divisive. Now, you talk to people who maybe focus on race, but I'm not sure that race can actually take up and pick up all the other areas of equity, whether it's social economic, gender, um, any number of identities. And so for us to keep narrowing back in the wording of this with the amendments back to racial, I think it becomes very divisive. I think it becomes very narrow uh, and it puts people, I think, in some groups, off. They're, they're not being taken care of. So I'm very concerned about that. Um, I think it would help the discussion tonight or down the road. Tell me again, because I think I heard it last time, why does it help to make race the central piece of this policy? Give me two or three sentences, Marciana, or next time around. I think that's the, that's the problem. Yeah, do you mind? Uh, very important. I want, to, I want to pause and highlight something just to make sure I read the policy the way I, I see it. Mm -hmm. um, the sentence that you highlighted, uh, the way I see the proposed policy will say, we will achieve equity when student identity, comma, including racial identity, comma, does not predict or predetermine success in school. And you have a problem with that sentence, correct? I do, because I think the original statement was well done. That is, we will achieve or equity means student identities, including racial. So it was broad and inclusive. And this, and then all the subsequent changes focus too much on race. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, Marciana, you want to answer that or? Sure, I think several of us can. Um, I think back on some of the conversations that we've had previously in, and I think this has come up several times. So one of the things that when I think about why the impetus to move from an educational equity policy to a racial equity policy is to really highlight, Jay, the importance of if we are able to support and really um, do the best we can for our historically marginalized communities first, it will support all groups. And so that's the reason, the main reason, um, kind of a, a uh, elevator speech uh, per se of why we have to include and have this be a racial equity policy because if we center if we center our work around our our, our historically marginalized communities first it will support all so that's why you see the word race come up multiple times. And when we met with the community, that was actually one of the things that came up during our focus groups as many of our communities were very um, appreciative of the fact that our district once for once was really highlighting the importance of race in this work and um, felt very proud that we were doing that as a, as a collective. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to uh, Lou and then Vince, and I want to go back to you, Jay, or you could. No, I've said my concerns. Awesome, thanks. So Lou and then Vince. Yeah, and I think it's also important to highlight that it's not just like historically um, unsupported and marginalized, but institutionally marginalized groups, and they're usually um, from certain racial demographics in um, and historically within our state, especially. And um, the policy, how it reads, it is a racial educational equity policy, how it's reading, but it's it also includes all the other identities and demographics that were listed um, farther down in the policy. So, um, and it's not only in the front part with the emphasis on um, race, but also farther in the policy it lists out all the other pieces that we would include, which includes socioeconomic and gender and all of the other pieces are still in here. So all of those, um, all of those concerns I think are included. It's just farther down in the policy where um, perhaps people didn't see it um, if there was concerns brought up from community about it. Um, and I would encourage folks to check that in, uh, and also to check out the recording of a previous meeting where we talked about this too, I think would be good because I know we talked about it in depth before the importance of focusing on that. Um, but yeah, that wasn't the main reason I raised my hand. I forgot, I end up listening so intently if I don't write my notes that I'm like, it's I'll, all right. come, I'll come I'll back. Come, I'll come back to you, Vince. 
Yeah, Jay, uh, to speak to your point, uh, one of the things that I really like about this policy is that it addresses the, the concept of intersectionality without saying the word. Uh, you can't search intersectionality in this document. It's not there, but it does address that. And I, in one part, it's in the last paragraph on the first page. It says, racial educational equity promotes the real possibility of racial equality of educational results for each student between diverse groups of students. And then on the next page, it gets kind of nuts and boltsy in, on number two, where it says consistently using district-wide and individual school level data disaggregated by race, ethnicity, language, special education, gender, so socioeconomic status, blah, 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 blah. And, it, and th there are other parts in the policy where it, it, it lays out in layman's terms, in terms that even I can understand, what intersectionality means. So while this, I understand that it's branded as a racial equity policy, it really addresses a broad array of identities. That's one of the things I like most about it. Thanks. Lou, uh, did you remember or shall I go for it? I remembered. I, remember. I think one of the main things that we need to keep in mind too um, is this is upholding our commitment as an um, anti-racist school district like the district has made that commitment already we're like almost a year into that commitment and this is putting that into action and it's kind of hard to be like we changed our mind like we already made that commitment we can't not commit to it anymore um, until we get there and so I think that that's something that's important to keep in mind that um, we're all aware of that commitment as a board and that this is one piece of doing anti-racist work as a district is to focus on race specifically. And so I think that's important for um, community to keep in mind too, is that is that is a district commitment. Thank you, Lou. Um, I want to comment that the way I read it, especially the sentence that was called out uh, previously, that this is a racial and educational equity that looks into the intersectionality that Vince and uh, Lou and my colleagues mentioned uh, called out. It's just like a rising tide uh, will lift every boat. And when uh, race has been and continues to be the common denominator of predicting and predetermining success in school, not for uh, an inherent uh, issue in race, but because of the system, the society, and the historical, uh, the momentum of the historical injustices that continue to be now, uh, race continues to be the major predictor and predeterminant of, uh, of uh, inequities. And when we address that, um, health, safety, nutrition, housing, and environmental uh, equities will be addressed uh, for those who are racially disadvantaged and for those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, and those who are uh, uh, experiencing disabilities, and I believe I believe that focus will address more efficiently inequities everywhere. Uh, that's how I see it. Also, I want to call out something important. This is a compassionate policy, a policy of compassion. I'm reflecting on a conversation I had with a white parent who asked me, "Do you feel in uh, 10 to 12 years when my uh, when his son would be in high school, a white uh, child, would they feel the guilt uh, if they go through policies like that and anti-racist work? And the way I answered it is no, they're going to feel the accountability and the responsibility and the compassion for privileges that exist and for uh, the responsibility that we need to make sure that uh, people who have been disadvantaged for years and decades and generations um, deserve our support and our compassion. Uh, it's a compassionate policy that will help us look into each other and how we can support each other and close the opportunity gap in science, math, arts, uh, everything. So that's, that's how I see it personally. Uh, that being said, uh, there is a reason why this is a first reading because we're presenting it to the public right now and we would like and I would like to encourage the public to give us feedback, to give us comments, uh, whether sharing their lived experiences over email uh, or their stories or their perspectives or language. 
uh, I believe part of our responsibility, you know, to uh, ask the community and the public to provide feedback. And I would like to encourage that. Uh, Vince? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to, well, I would like to speak as a white cisgender male, heterosexual person from the dominant culture. I'm just really, one of the things that's the hardest things about being a white man in society during this time is that we may, if we're compassionate, we want to do something. But once we come to terms with the reality that racism is fundamentally a that people in the dominant culture are responsible for, there's a deep weight there because we don't know what to do. I lived most of my life not feeling responsible for racism or to address racism in my life. What I really appreciate about this policy is it lays out very clearly for me as a school board member, as a white male school board member, I can see very clearly what I need to do. I can see very clearly what, what work I need to do specifically. This is a nice, very, very convenient roadmap for leadership for anybody, but particularly for a person with my background. So I really, really appreciate this document a lot because it's so clear and so powerful. And for a person who doesn't have the lived experience of being racialized, yeah, I, I need a crib sheet so I know what to do. So I'm more than just an ally playing along. I can actually get something done on my own. Thank you. Any further discussion? I guess I just need to respond. Um, I believe that the original policy captured the goal of what every teacher and leader and board member should have, which is every kid needs to be treated to move them up and succeed, no matter what their background is. Secondly, you said you think that the biggest predictor of educational performance is race. I'm not sure that's the data that I pulled from my training in that I think a bigger factor may well be, number one, social economic, and number two, in some cases, gender. That is, we tend to have tended to have categories. And then we have a number of other issues, whether it's disability or uh, ethnic background, or even in some cases, religion or faith. So I think that this mistake policy says, we have faith that if we do this well for race, we'll have everything else taken care of. That should not be the standard. The standard should be every child needs to be looked at. And if there are burdens in the way that are unfair, unjust, inequitable, we need to work on cleaning them up. So I, I, I will go home and do some research on race versus social economic and other factors. But um, I, I appreciate the fact that we've done some heavy work. Thank you, Marcy Ann and all the group. Um, I just don't think it's right headed. So we'll, we'll see. Thank you. All right. Last uh, word or two words uh, from Therese and then Lou, and then we need to move on to Corvallis online. So Therese and then Lou. Okay, I'm just going to be short and say that I, I do think that every kid does deserve to be lifted up. It's just that a lot of them already are. And, you know, as a parent of a white child, a white male child, um, I, that's just not something that I worry about. I don't worry about representation for him. And I just think every parent who is not the parent of a white male child deserves also not to have to worry about whether or not their school district is going to be able to represent their kid. And I think that's why we have to call that race because your average, I, I grew up in a low income family. I understand that socioeconomics matter, but I also know that I was better off as a white poor person than the non-white poor people in my community. I got opportunities that were not afforded to them. There were things people were willing to do for me because of my racial alignment with them that were not provided to other people. And I cannot deny that. And I'm not responsible directly for why people were willing to afford those opportunities to me. But now that I'm aware of it, I am responsible for what I do with that knowledge. And that responsibility to that knowledge says that I, I absolutely have to both name it for what it is 
And then wherever I am able to call it out and work to dismantle it in other places. And so I very much hear, I don't want any child to be left behind, but I can't deny that there are individuals and race is a significant predictor that are going to be left behind if we're not intentionally crafting policies to keep that from happening and to, and not to keep it from happening. Like we're there, like we're saviors to keep it from happening, like taking deconstructing the systems that continue to make it so easy for it to happen so implicitly and without intention. I want to be really clear that I don't think we have teachers in our district that it would intentionally marginalize any child, but the implicit processes are very real. And so I want every parent to be able to have the confidence that their child will be seen by people who look like them, like I am able to have. I know that that's not true right now. And I hope this policy would be something that would help us move in that direction. And I also realize I wasn't short. I apologize. Lou? Um, I just want the community and, and students who put their efforts and love into this policy to hear from somebody that this policy isn't wrong because for it to be framed as the wrong direction when that much love and effort has been put into it by community and students and staff, I feel is disrespectful to that work. And I want them to know that they're supported in the work that they put in here. And I would encourage folk if they do have um, questions about the importance of this to please, I don't know if somebody can give the exact date of which meeting it was um, where Marciana and um, Kristen presented this initially before it went out to community because we already talked about this at length. And Kristen also offered um, to provide resources about the, um, the research that talks about um, race being the dominant predictor. Um, and so I, I would say that if folk are curious that are on the board that need that research and that backing to reach out to Kristen since she offered to share the, those materials with us. Um, and that was all. All right. Sammy, can I say one last thing? Right That's here. okay. I know it's late. Um, yeah. Are you sure? Okay. Um, one thing that I wanted to uh, close with is um, the intentionality of the we language in the policy. And I think it really goes to Lou's point. When we met with the community members, health navigators, um, affinity groups, safe students, our Delta families, all of them felt that adding the we language does a couple of things. It equalizes power. And it really brings a community into a policy where the policy that was that we had before was untouchable to them and it didn't re represent them. And so I heard many of you talk about the word compassion and how this policy really represents our community. And when I think about the board goals, which is racial equity and community engagement, um, from my perspective, I think this is one of the first policies that really represents our community. And one of the things that we talk about, the policy can be words on the page, but it's the action, it's the follow through that we are committing to as a district. And so I also too wanna to thank our communities for putting their, their, not only their perspectives, but also sharing their stories. And these focus groups were, um, I think a true testament of the importance of reaching out to our communities and bringing their perspectives to these policies. And so I believe that this new policy uh, really represents our community and, um, and values and honors them in so many different ways. So thank you so much. And um, I look forward to our next session together. Thank you very much, Marcian. I appreciate, really appreciate your work and uh, everybody's work who uh, and time that they put into this. Uh, next item of the agenda is Gravel's online application. And uh, I believe this item is for action. And uh, we have, uh, Melissa, you have uh, something to share or brief uh, about uh, the application? So, so brief. Here's what I can tell you. 
Um, we had Corvallis online this school year and uh, we had quite a few students who were enrolled. We um, have looked at what's coming up for next year and ODE has really kind of telegraphed to us that schools will have to provide a CDL option and Corvallis online was our CDL option this year. We also polled our parents who were involved in Corvallis Online and asked them, would you do it next year? And as you can see in the board report, 64 of those respondents said, absolutely. And 128 said, we kind of need to see what next year looks like. And that had to do with what the school district's doing in person, but also what COVID looks like and looks like for their family. So um, based on that, um, those, those kind of two big players for us, we want to provide the Corvallis Online option again next year, but we'd like to offer it as an independent school so that we can track data so that um, it is not kind of all kind of jumbled up with all of the other schools in the district and it's its own separate entity. It would not be a program where out of, out of resident students could apply to come to. It is solely for Corvallis students. We would, um, we would still have a, an assistant, or I'm sorry, principal for the elementary, principal for the high school, and we would work on staffing. And staffing's like a chicken and egg thing. Well, like we want, some, we're gonna put some staffing in place and then we're gonna see how many kids enroll in August and then we might have to add more. Um, but what we need from the, um, from the board tonight is authorization to seek an institutional ID for Corvallis Online, which is kind of like one of the first steps in getting our application into the state. All right, Therese, and then Lou, Therese. So um, my understanding of the reading and, and I think was confirmed by what you just said is that the seeking the ID is the initial step, uh, which is not necessarily a commitment that we will, I mean, I think that we probably will have to be prepared to offer something because of ODE, but my question is just this, what's the threshold at which, because I, you know, I just, I don't know. So what, what. Oh, I lost her. Oh, can you hear me now? You said, what well, you said threshold and then we didn't catch your question. Oh, dude. <laughs> now I can't remember it. It's after 10 o'clock. Um, okay. That's okay. If we wait like three minutes, we can replay it on the YouTube channel. Right. And then we can just get it that way. I think my question was, what number makes this not sustainable? How many families have to do this for it to be able to, for us to be able to afford to dedicate the staff and the resources to pull it off? Ryan, have you, do you have a- Yeah, answer? so I would say um, that this, up for the upcoming year, we would be using some of those federal relief dollars um, for Corvallis Online. Um, in anticipation of um, ha having it in place for one more year, and then making a, a and then making a decision again, I don't feel like we're in this space where we're saying we're making a ten year commitment like we do with uh, Muddy Creek when we sign a charter for five years. Um, we're really saying we're going to try maintain this for another year uh, because um, we've had that request from families uh, through our surveying, and we will assess it again. Um, and so I, I, we have not spent a lot of time, Therese, looking at what is the break-even point because we've had these federal dollars that are around recovery and maintaining that option for kids. That is something that we'll continue to assess um, as we move forward. Um, but for this upcoming year, it's really the intention is to continue to provide that option on a, on a, for, on a one-year basis. Okay. And so then I assume going beyond that, we would be looking at those numbers to figure out if it's sustainable. Yeah. And then my follow up to that, and then I'm done, is um, if it if it is um, successful in this coming year, if we have participation and enrollment, is this something that you could foresee down the road opening to um, people not in Corvallis? Or do you imagine, or maybe you can't answer that right now, but that's my question. So my concern with that is that there are some virtual charter schools in the state of Oregon, and they have kids from across the state, and they have created systems to travel the state and do state testing and all these other factors um, that come into play as you grow beyond your um, geographic boundary. And that would be another really important conversation to have before we would ever move in that direction um, because of the because again, that impacts our ability to do it well. 
one of the things I've liked about Corvallis Online has been it's been our teachers with our kids. And then you begin to lose some of that. So um, I don't I don't see that necessarily as um, a goal from this for this school, rather than it creates another option for um, families in our community. Okay, thank you. Awesome, Zoo. Um, Therese kind of asked my question. It was more along like there's still Corvallis students, right? And um, in how long this would go on for? Because I think it's showing that need, and hopefully we can find a way to meet that need beyond the pandemic. And so this could be a good pathway to that. But that was, yeah, it was basically a thing. I've, I've had conversations this week with Oregon superintendents and superintendents um, who um, primarily in the Midwest a group of superintendents I meet with. Um, and they're all having the same debate about, and some of them didn't um, um, put up a online school last year, but they're thinking about it for this upcoming year. And so there's a lot of a lot of flex or flux, um, pardon me, um, and, and what to do. And that's why I think we, we know we want to continue it for next year and then we're going to have to reassess. Yeah. Vince. My questions have been answered. So I would ask, it, will the chair entertain a motion? Yes, what's your motion? I move to authorize the district to submit an, an application for the new institutional ID for Corvallis Online for the 2021 2022 school year. Is there a second? Second. Uh, I think. I think Jay got it. I think Jay got it. Sorry. <laughs> There's something about this. All right. Any further discussion? See none. Uh, the question on the, uh, the, the 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 motion on the uh, on the table is uh, to authorize the district to submit an application for a new institutional ID for Corvallis Online for the 2021-22 school year. Director Adams, what's your vote? Aye. Director Conroy, what's your vote? Aye. Director Jones, what's your vote? Aye. Director White Bear? Aye. Vice Chair Finger McDonald? Aye. And Chair Adrobo votes aye. And we do have, passes unanimously, we have uh, a new school. And I think it's been at least since your time in the events. But what, when was the last time we saw a, a new institutional ID? Probably more than a decade. Oh, that's before my time. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Long time. So that's, that's a milestone. Probably College Hill. Oh, I was going to say College Hill. College, college Hill. Hill. I have one because it's embedded in the school. So it's yeah. not even its own. Not even College Hill. Yeah. So that's a milestone. Let's reflect on that for a second. <laughs> All right, next item on the agenda is consolidated action. And uh, for the record, and I want to uh, highlight for uh, that we do have item 8D, non-resident transfer allocation that was added uh, earlier uh, today. So just uh, for uh, disclosure, and that's part of the consolidated action. Uh, with that, uh, does any board member wish to pull out or discuss or ask questions about an item from consolidated action? Vince? So I have one question on policy JFCM, and then I would like to comment on policy BF, license personnel action, and uh, the appointment of the budget committee member. All right, you're a little bit faster than me. Can you say the one? Sorry, more? sorry. So you got the JFCM. That's the actual real work. Then comment on BF. Mm -hmm. Comment on license per personnel action. Mm -hmm. And then comment on appointment to the budget committee. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other board member uh, wish to pull out something? Okay. I have the same two or two of those. That sounds good. So let's start with JFCM. Uh, Vince? So JFCM. Um, I found one, I, well, on page two, paragraph, oh no, I forget which paragraph, I didn't note it. It's the one that starts with the building administrator or Disney, and I forget where it is in the document, but it's at the bottom. It says design instead of designee. So there's a typo there. Got it, thank so, you. Yep. And then I had a question. Uh, there's a mention here 
uh, that the district will obtain uh, a student evaluation by a licensed mental health professional before allowing the student to return into the classroom setting. And it just, I understand that for our district, we have additional capacity to meet this requirement, but there was some, it just feels like a high bar. Uh, both, it just seems like a high bar for the district. And I'm just, I just wanna ask, is this boxing the district in or placing an undue expectation on the district to place a licensed personnel on a person or on a child before they return to the classroom? And, and it's just a question. I, I, it just seems like a very high bar to me. So when you look at, um, uh, so one through five, so that starts on page one and then goes to page two, Number five says obtain a student evaluation, and remembering that these are um, these are these are actions that you could consider to implement. So this isn't something we have to do. Um, Got it. And the section that is highlighted about entering into contracts with licensed mental health, or or were you specifically talking about five? It was just that particular provision. Yeah. Well, I understood the contract piece, yeah. and so that that is optional. Okay, right. so if uh, so, if we have a licensed person there in the building already, I just. I don't want undue delay. If the kid de-escalates and is going to be regulated and, you know, let's get the kid back in instruction Absolutely. if we can. It was the thought, the thought process that I had when I was navigating that. But since this is, it get, leaves it to the administrator's discretion, right? then that I'm completely comfortable with that. So thank you for that. Uh -huh. Any further comments on JFCM? So with that, uh, Melissa, I take it from uh, what Vince mentioned, uh, we're, we're going to approve JFCM with uh, the change and design into a designee, right? Yes, and, and I'm looking on that. So I see, I see designee in the sentence prior to number one and two at the bottom of page one. Mm -hmm. My copy says designee, so is it somewhere else? Yeah, Vince, uh, you're muted. You sorry, I'll hunt it down for you, oh. and then we can come back around. Melissa, I found it. Oh, okay. I changed it. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Erica. All right, so the, we will be approving it with that change, right? Um, Lou, uh, on DFCM? I'm just confused. I thought that that was under information. It is, and I, I, it is an information, because these are all for, JFCM is a first read. But okay, that's why I was like, I'm, I was just completely scrolling up and down, like, what happened? I read the word book wrong. And so, okay, because I have comments on some of the other ones and information, but we're just doing action right now, right? Yeah. You're right. So, okay. thank I was you. Really confused. I'm sorry. I, yes. I needed sorry. a point of clarification, as the saying goes with the Roberts rules. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. <laughs> point of clarification in order. And uh, yes, thank you. So, uh, we got the DFCM. Let's go back now to consolidated action. And within consolidated action, we have BF and consolidated action. So let's talk about BF. Um, Vince. You're muted. Sorry. I'm the one that pulled this down into consolidated information. My bust. You're Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you didn't stop me. <laughs> Guilty. Not my fault. Too tired no, to tell sorry. you part. No, so. I was just going to comment on policy BF that I just really enjoy the, I really like the way this policy reads now. The revisions, I know this has gone around several times, but I think for me, it, it read really well. So I was just, I, I put in my notes, love this policy. <laughs> That's it. Awesome. Uh, any other comments on BF? Lou? Oh, you're good? Okay. So next item on the action, we have uh, the uh, licensed personnel action as a reminder. Uh, yeah, uh, Vince, you know what, what, what you need to do. So Vince, what, what's your comments? Well, no, I just wanted to say, well, I just wanted to say welcome to you know, Sean Bernard, uh, the new SPED coordinator. Um, it'll be nice to have that, that additional position. And then our two uh, assistant principals at CHS, uh, Jermaine Joseph Hayes and Emmett Whitaker. I can't wait to meet these people in person. I'm not liking this pandemic thing. And then I saw on people retiring, uh, just saying farewell to Peg Cornell and Donna Keim. Uh, 
I've been with this district for a little bit now. And so I don't, I don't know a Corvella school district without Pig or Donna. It's, it's hard to see P these people retire that, you know, that are, are real, they're mentors uh, to board members. And so it's just thank them, thanking them for their service. Um, I'm sorry, it's late, words are escaping me. So just being maudlin and, and just, uh, sorry to see those folks go. And congratulate them. I just wanna build on what you said, Vince. Um, Peg at CV and Donna at College Hill and then offering her work with uh, the annual interviews and helping kids get beyond CV and CHS. Mm -hmm. And then a name that you didn't mention, a good friend of mine and a great teacher, Gerhard Behrens. Um, he had been at Adams for years as a classroom teacher and then stepped a little bit sideways and became a health PE teacher. He's just a great mentor for all three, are great mentors for kids. They're, they're just real practical trench people. And so congratulations to them and thank you for all the heavy work they did for all those years. Yeah, and I wish there were there are in-person uh, retirement parties, but uh, if there's any, I would love to attend those. Those are mentors. They, yeah. I've learned a lot from them in my short time so far, and I know they've, they've educated generations, literally. Yeah. Um, next item on the agenda is appoint a uh, budget committee member, and uh, Vince, what's your comment about it? So I just uh, was delighted when I read that uh, that our colleague in the campaign, uh, Shauna Tomney, is applied to be on the budget committee. She comes with immense budget experience uh, in her um, in her management of, it's called OPEC, and I'm gonna butcher the name. It's the Oregon Parent Education Coalition or Collaborative, or I forget what the C stands for. Anyway, it's a statewide program and she just comes with great budgeting skills and deep, deep experience and expertise in child development. I think she's gonna be a tremendous asset on the, on the budget committee. And so I was just really delighted to see that and I'm looking looking forward to voting for a consolidated action uh, to take all these actions, but uh, bring her onto our budget committee. Thank you. And as for the record, that's uh, a uh, vacancy that has been uh, vacant since February, and uh, this was uh, the only applicant. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that the public understood that this was a position that's been open for a while. That it's been advertised. Anybody could have applied for this position and we got one application and, and um, just because I don't want there to be any um, perception that oh, I got, I got the there was anything special happening here. I, you, this has been since February, one person applied. So yeah, I think that's important for people to know. Okay. I would go one step further. We had a chance to meet with Shauna who applied for a board vacancy a while back and she was very impressive and got a lot of good positive reviews there. So I think it's a, it's a positive follow through, not a concern. Yes, thank you. All right, with that, uh, the chair uh, would like to entertain a motion for regarding consolidated action. Uh, any motion? I move that we approve the items in consolidated action. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. Any further discussion? See none. Uh, Director Jones, what's your vote? Aye. Director White Bear, what's your vote? Aye, now that I am muted. <laughs> Director Conroy, what's your vote? Aye. Director Adams? Aye. And Vice Chair Springer McDonald? Aye. And Chair Dropbox was aye, fast unanimously. All right, now consolidated information. And uh, for the record, we deliberated on JFCM. Uh, <laughs> is there any further uh, discussion on JFCM? I have no further items. All right. Any uh, Anything that you would like to pull out? Sarah and Lou, what would you like to pull out? Sarah, oh, okay. No, I just didn't put my hand down. I'm not good at that tonight. How about Lou? I a question for sake of um, time and efficiency. Um, Melissa, do you just want me to email you all the links that didn't work instead of pulling? 
I know. I'm the weird one. I am the weird one who does look at them. But no, I think you need to read every one of them into the record. <laughs> just so that every all three people that are still listening can look them up themselves. Okay. The record, I'm, Lou, I'm kidding. For the record, Lou is mentioning uh, links uh, for uh, the Oregon revised statues and uh, things on the PDF that don't work. He always pointed those out. Thank you, Lou. It's so important because it used to be frustrating for me when something doesn't work. Yeah, so. it's, really, it's not when you're being the second read. Um, but I did want to ask if we could talk about um, um, JB. And I just had a comment on the one that has a really, really long one. It's like the last one. It's the JHCDA-AR. The medications? Yeah. Okay. And, um, I had a clarifying question on LBEA, and I had a question about BCF. Ooh. Just like, right. sorry, y'all. Any anything else? <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, I could have pulled all of them, Sammy, but just for the links. A for the record, uh, for our board organization, are you comfortable with the language that we have from OSBA? I am. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that very much. Awesome. Thanks. So as a, as a note, the, um, the board calendar is just there for information, and it will come back next month when you take action on that policy, BCBCA, and then we'll bring that calendar forward. Um, because the mechanics are right now, we have a calendar that has a July 1st board meeting, but with the adoption of BCBCA, then we would um, potentially remove that July 1st meeting because that wouldn't have a purpose. Does that make sense? It does to me. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, with that, uh, let's talk with uh, item B1, which is BCF. Uh, Lou? Um, yeah, I had a, a specific question about that before. It did not include resolutions when we first had this conversation. Or um, wait, not resolutions, proclamations. Is that the real? Wait, let me double check. I'm sorry, I need to pull it up. Um, resolutions. Uh, it was resolutions, uh, Parker says. That's one of the parts he added. Was the, um, the resolutions, mm -hmm. not just policies, like how we did the, hold on, let me pull it up. I'm going to to it. I can. So uh, Parker can speak to it if you want. Uh, you're talking about you're talking about um, BFC, the adoption and revision of policies. That one. BCF. Yeah, it was resolutions. I thought it was just talking about policies being two weeks, and then did we talk about resolutions too? We reached out to OSBA based on uh, Jay's questions. And they gave us this response as suggested language. He did say that the resolutions, if we wanted to, could be moved to another policy. But I believe that Jay was also talking about resolutions as well uh, in his statement. So I included it there just so we could have the discussion about it. Okay, I do have a little bit of concern about that. Just thinking about some of the work we've done this year, like with Indigenous Peoples Day, were those, would that have, would that fall under this? In and my like, understanding. Yeah, my and like, understanding is yes. Okay, yeah, I do have a bit of, oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Yeah, um, all of our, all resolutions would fall under that um, if that was, if it was adopted like this. Okay, I do have, uh, I do have concern with that because I don't think that, unless we have some really thinking with, <laughs> um, I think sometimes, we're like, oh, look at these deadlines and how far out do we need to plan? And like, if we would have had to do that for Indigenous Peoples Day, it would have had to happen like in what, June? Cause I'm trying to think back of like how many meetings, maybe it could have happened in August. Um, but sometimes we are, we become aware of things that are important to the community that we'll end up excluding by having a policy like this that we didn't mean to exclude. And I don't think that it would be good to have something in policy and then, then say like, there's all these urgent situations coming up now to ask for exception to policy. Um, so that's where my thinking was with the concern about having that in there in particular, based on the two that we did bring in kind of a little bit later. Um, yeah. 
Okay. Just to respond, I think that the my intent was that there is a, a clause that allows us to declare that we don't need to wait two weeks and we can justify that to the public, like just what you said. Oh, it, it came up emergency, we need to. But otherwise, I think we talked about a goal of the board being um, more focused on community communications and adequate transparency and response time. So I think it sets the bar as generally speaking, we like to have a, a certain amount of time, but we always have a, a reasonable exception. And I think it, I think the, the opt-out gives us that exception. I think resolutions are, are very valuable, but if possible, it, they deserve good, transparent and, and open uh, okay. back and forth with, with community as well. So yeah. I'll, I'll provide my two cents on this. I've seen, honestly, I'll be honest uh, about how, trans, not transparent, how, heads, how much of a heads up we give. I've seen uh, governmental entities in the region here, local. Um, I couldn't see the language of the resolution until the entity, uh, the governing body voted. So after they voted, I was able to get it. Uh, exactly, and Jay is shaking yeah, his head. It, I mean, like, it, it, it is sad, unfortunately. I think that's a, a very low bar. Now, we have a higher bar here where we get our pub, the public can access the material as soon as we access it as board members. Um, and uh, sometimes there are those urgencies where you need to create a resolution presented to the board. I, I feel conflicted between expediency and deliberation. That's where there, why there is a Senate and a House probably, I don't know. But uh, the idea is there is this conflict be between these two things, expediency and deliberation. And in both, in both of them, we should be doing it in the public eye, which is the minimum bar. Uh, as we deliberate, we need to show the community what we're doing, they need to access it. Uh, honestly, I feel my experience with another governing body where I can't even read the language until it's uh, uh, voted on is not acceptable. People need to have the right to say, hey, uh, Jay, Lou, Sami, I don't feel I'm comfortable with this resolution or that resolution before we vote on it. Um, would that lead us to say we want to have two meetings, 14 days in between? I think that's a much higher bar. I think there's a potential consequence to it or uh, like, an, I don't wanna call it negative consequence, but there's a cost to it. And that's, I think Lou is highlighting here. Um, and eventually maybe the future boards, if we adopt this, every resolution will be an emergency, um, right? I think that's what I was trying to avoid was like, we, I know we have the clause, but it's like, I think it's gonna create a lot of, request it could i'm not going to say it will but it could create a lot of requests for policy exception and then at that point it like kind of counter um is counterproductive to have the policy if we continually ask for exceptions and i'm not trying to say i don't want the public to have um like advance notice i think that um we have our materials ready i think friday or saturday before the meeting it's just a little bit under a week and um, I don't see the board putting forth resolutions that are super damaging to the community at all. Like, I don't think we do damaging work in general. And so that's where I think the resolution when I just think there is some unintended things that happen. And, um, and honestly, it kind of feels like almost a reaction to some of the resolutions that we've passed in shorter timelines. And I know that's not the intent, but I don't want the community to um, read it that way either. Like, okay, we passed these ones on short notice and now we're asking for resolutions to have a two week, this specifically. And I know that's not what's going on with the resolution piece. I know that was what prompted the policy piece, but the resolution pieces came in later. Like we didn't even talk about the resolutions that was brought in by, um, by OSBA's recommendation. And so that's where I was like, that wasn't really what we had initially talked about. I, I do, um, Lou, I'm the one who asked the question of OSBA, and I did in that conversation here, um, the resolution piece, 
Um, again, this is your policy, so you 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 can decide one way or the other. But it it wasn't. Um, I just want to be clear that it wasn't OSBA alone and just saying, hey, if you want to do resolutions, do it this way too. It was me asking that question. Okay, but it wasn't like based on Jay's recommendation in the first place is what I'm trying to say. Like this wasn't like necessarily, it was specifically about policy, it's not it, but- so that, I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, but I thought that was your intent is to do policy and resolution. I don't remember <clears throat> specifically thinking resolution, okay. but the board acts in two ways, either in adopting policies or adopting resolutions. Mm -hmm. And to me, the underlying value applies to both mm -hmm. with the caveat that says, and if by chance we catch up short mm -hmm. for any sort of good reason, we can quote, make an exception. But I think to worry that we're making exceptions is to miss the point. The point is, give people a fair opportunity to know what we're doing after a reasonable opportunity to deliberate, unless you have to have an exception. So wow. to me, it's worrying about something that you shouldn't worry about until it's a problem and it's not a problem to make exceptions. I don't think, but. Yeah, I have the other added layer of concern of like um, perception and how this could be read as in like, it's a reaction to a very specific um, very specific things that were passed this year is how it could be read. So the things that would fall under this actually are the school rename. And that was mentioned as prompting this request. Indigenous Peoples Day and Black History Month are the ones that had that short timeline. And I think like, I'm not trying to overread it, but I'm saying like, those are the three things that would have been impacted by this policy being in place this year. And so I think we just need to be careful about the message that's sent to the community and explain that that is not necessarily the intent, even though it was expressed, it was the intent with one instance. So, so uh, Lou, I, have, I have to ask, because I, she's asked me for my intent. So Lou, I heard the school naming policy. I heard the, in, the indigenous, day. indigenous day and what was the other one? Uh, the black history. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I'm going to be real clear. I would have supported an exception for Indigenous Day and, Bla and Black History Month, absolutely. Because I get totally that we we got a moving calendar and it's hard to remember all these things. So if anybody wants any intent, I am not concerned about that action. I am concerned about school naming and other processes. And I so I want to be real clear. Okay. Um, see other three. people. Sorry. Uh, Therese and then Vince. Sorry, I can't find the mute button. So, uh, I think maybe my question got answered. So I come back to me. Uh, I I need to think for a second about whether or not what was just exchanged. Teresa, we lost you into unmute. Yeah, I you back. lost. I, I, am I there now? You're, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. I was just gonna say that I need to ponder if that exchange actually answers my question. So, and to keep us moving forward, I'm gonna remove myself for the moment and then I'll put my hand back up if I think it didn't. Sounds good. Uh, Vince next, and before I, I go to Vince, I'm thinking if we end up uh, having different directions around this policy, I would recommend maybe I wanna to listen to Vince and if there's anyone else wanna speak, maybe I would recommend uh, sending me and Parker, um, I don't want to call it your iterations or I'm, I'm thinking about process. If you do prefer the policy pass in a different language than what we have in the packet, maybe communicate that uh, so we can bring in the second reading a policy that we can get consensus on. Um, is that an appropriate process? I think you would just bring it back as for amendments. And yeah. As for amendments. Uh -huh. Okay. So prepare your amendments for next meeting uh, based on this language. So the language here is the basis. And if you want to add something or take something out, uh, just to acknowledge that we might not have a full consensus uh, tonight. Uh, Vince? So as I reflect about this, first, I want to say I really applaud Jay's intent behind this, this policy change. I think that it's 
it's addressing part of the problem that this board has had for some time. Uh, you know, we have struggled to be available and with to the public. Um, and we don't, we hear a slice of the public. We don't hear the whole public. Um, and this board has, has stated multiple times uh, that community engagement is an area where we want to do work. And so when I think about this particular policy revision, I see it as kind of like a little Band-Aid on a really, really big cut. And I think that we're just thinking too small here. I think that this may be part of a larger solution, but I don't think that this board has stepped back and really taken the full scope of the work that we need to do to be truly engaged with our community. And so this could be part of a policy solution down the road, but right now this just feels like a small step. I don't even know if it checks a box. I'm not even sure that it's going to address the intended problem. So I, I would ask that the board uh, stop and think a little bit more about this and think more broadly about how we're going to uh, implement different policy structures to be more engaged with our community. And I think we have, we have work to do uh, in that area. That's my comment. On that note, uh, I, uh, from Vince, I would say let's uh, reflect. And if you have amendments, uh, please submit them to Parker uh, in advance so we can have the language. Uh, and then we can debate it next, uh, next meeting. But I believe, uh, Vince, you okay. touched a really important point for our reflection that we need to have. Uh, on this. So next item on the agenda is JB, Equal Educational Opportunity, and that's just from Lou, correct? Yeah, it was, that was a policy where I was going to ask if we could add gender expression into. That one's, that one's way shorter. That was it on that one. All right. And any comments or feedback? Okay. So policy JHCD, JCCEA, medication formerly known as prescription medication. You're muted. Luke. I think I left myself unmuted and then muted myself to talk. <laughs> it's getting late. Um, it was the one that's all the way down. Is this still in the right section? It's like 9B12. Yeah, it's the medication ones, um, but it was the AR one in particular. Um, it's the last one in our pack. Um, I just wanted to say that that's really, that's so important. I'm glad to see that in there. It was, it was a comment um, to be able to perhaps save somebody's life um, with an unfortunate, if that was an unfortunate incident when some, if somebody did overdose. So I just thought that was a, a really strong and important thing to add in. And I hope we don't have to use it, but I'm glad it's there. Thank you. Our nurses agree and feel the same way. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Lou, uh, next up is, uh, sorry, any other questions or comments on this one? Okay, next up is LBEA, residential student denial for virtual uh, public charter school attendance. I had a question on that one. That would only ever, so the way that's written, that decision would come to us if it was over that 3%, right? Anything other we wouldn't have to worry about. It was just a clarifying question. Okay, I just want to make sure that that was super clear. Okay, that was all. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question about that one. Are we expecting any change from the legislator about this or is it already dead in terms of changing the percentage? I don't think that that's going to happen in this session. Okay. All right, good to know. Um, anything else from the consolidated information? All right, look at us, we're not at 1130. Um, so board member comments. <coughs> Any board member comments? Vince. Sorry, everybody, I know it's late. So meeting in person, I, I'm totally eager to meet in person, but I, I didn't get the like the okay sign or or I know that there was some informal discussion about that, but can we meet in person now? Yes, the answer is yes, uh, we can. I'm sorry if I did not communicate that clearly, but uh, okay. yes, the answer is yes. 
I look forward to coming to the DO for our next meeting. Yeah, we have your name ready, uh, Vince. But I, I would say maybe I chose for me. I did the check in with board members. I don't know. I for whatever reason I mi I missed that. But not budget meeting. Um, yes. No. Yeah, budget Correct. meeting will be virtual. Yes. <laughs> okay, budget meeting virtual. Do you want just all my? I have three items. Do you want them all? Go for it. Okay, so uh, I just want to. I don't want to pick at the TDAC. I just think that there's something there that the board can learn about. I, there's learning there. I'd like to know more about that. One of the things that I, that this was a process that happened over, over the course of a year and this, is, this was the first time I ever heard about it. So I, I feel a little blindsided having people show up and, and I just didn't know it was happening. Um, and I think there was, there's some learning there. And I think that there's something about these committees. And I think that there may be some policy structure there to support the district in doing this work. And so I just want us to, I guess I'm looking at Ryan and saying, can we think about that? And can you come back with maybe something there? I don't know. Yeah, I think we can come back with some more information for you on that. Um, it, yeah. won't be at, it won't be at the June meeting. Um, no, 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 no. But but that is something where we can provide some an update to you. No, and I was just, and I mean that in the most collaborative sense. Um, yeah. It's just it's like wow, this was a really good process. May not have happened as well as it could have, but I mean, I think that maybe district, you didn't have the support and that you needed from us to ensure that. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not gonna. It's late. Um, and then you already talked about uh, getting us some uh, a report on math tracking and academic impacts. Apparently, you know, people are getting frustrated with that. So I think the board needs to be educated on the science behind the changes that we've been making for some time now. And so let's just get the, the board skilled up on that. I think yeah. is what we need to do. Yeah, and, and just to speak to that for a minute, um, that that process has been underway for quite some time. Right. Um, and that when I spoke earlier, um, I was really talking about um, more parent engagement um, in that conversation. Right. right. I just, I don't know that I'm feeling completely solid on the underlying science. And so I think I'd like to, I'd like to learn more. So maybe push us some reading or something, and then we can have a discussion. Maybe the summer would be a good time to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's all I have. Just to follow up on that question, <clears throat> I think clarification of has there been a decision that we will do X and Y in the area of math mm -hmm. needs to be communicated because I think they've got some parents and some schools think that they have, some not. And I guess remind us as to kind of like Vince saying, what is the process that we as a board are engaged in that decision? Or is it something that we just stand back and talk about math curriculum adoption and we said yes at some point or not? Because I think I think there is a big disconnect. I, I strongly believe that it's not based in solid math learning and it doesn't address the problem as people spoke really well tonight. Um, but you know, I respect people working hard and trying to figure out how to do it. So uh, sorry, uh, uh, I went out of the process, but is there any further comments on the math tracking since uh, we went into it? Sarah? Yeah, I think um, some of the things I've been hearing from, from parents are not just around elementary school, but this worry that, that I think was expressed tonight that it's going to impact no, um, this person's going to of math all the way through high school and what math students will be able to access. So just a fuller picture of how the changes that maybe are happening in elementary school will impact or not impact um, the opportunity students will have as they you know, get into middle school and high school. Yeah. Um, any Sammy. further comments? On, uh, oh. Yes, Therese. I have a comment about the math thing. So that was on my list of things to, um, to hit on. So um, to not repeat what's already been said, 
I will say I, I do not feel clear on how firmly cemented the district is on this change. Um, because I feel like I've heard some, I've heard language from the district that feels like we're in process or we're, we're, we're considering, but then clearly some communication somewhere has triggered for some parents that it is a done deal. And so I think we have, there's a, there's a big miss somewhere in that communication that we, we definitely need to clear up. The other thing I wanted to say is that I would encourage, I love Vince's idea of educating the board on the literature behind why this would be potentially a good move for improving um, math outcomes. I think there's um, uh, certainly, although a case can be made for math leveling, a strong case can be made for not. And so I would, I think it would be great for the board to get to hear from you um, and to learn more, it's going to be really difficult to advocate um, on behalf of the district when we don't really understand it ourselves. So we need to be students of this from you it would be very helpful. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say is that I think that one thing that doesn't seem to be clear to people is that not having math leveling doesn't mean that kids don't get more challenged in math. And so that would be really helpful if we could communicate that not, not, uh, disaggregating math levels the way that we did before does not equal if you already know how to do this, you have to sit there and there's nothing for you to do. Because that's what I'm hearing from parents is their fear. And I get that fear. Um, but I also know having been in programs where leveling was done away with, that is not what happens in the classroom experience. And so bringing some of our teachers out, our trusted teachers, teachers that we have repeatedly, you know, we've waved our flags of support for and let them be spokespeople for why they want to teach this way, I think would go a long way in helping parents understand both what's going to actually happen and um, have more confidence in it, which just kind of dovetails just generally with my, my suggestion often that as a district, we offer our parents more tangible um, examples and, and applications of what we mean about the way something's going to hit the classroom because they do not know this language uh, the way that our instructors know this language. And so um, it is really, I, as a parent, it would be very disempowering to hear um, that something, it doesn't matter if it's math or English or sex ed, it doesn't matter if I just hear this is going to happen and I can't hear from the people that are going to deliver the curriculum, how they're going to do it successfully. It's, that's a very fear provoking things. So I think this would be a brilliant um, move for bridging the gap between our district and our parents and our general community. And it would go a long way building on the confidence that I, I do believe our community has, that our teachers do know what they're doing. Um, I, that's all I have to say about math. I have a couple other things, but it's not about math. So I'll come back to that. All right. So I'll get back to you, but I want to just add a very quick thing about math. I feel there's a lot for me to learn too. Um, and for public disclosure, uh, correct me, Ryan, if I'm wrong, we never did a deliberation or a decision by the board on this issue, right? No, we haven't. Yeah, just yeah. to make sure, because some people told me like the board did or acted, mm -hmm. I don't remember anything of that. Yeah. However, I trust as we get into this conversation that it will be shared with us in a way where you will tell us how are we closing the opportunity gap? That's mm -hmm. what equity is all about. Um, investing resources where the need is most by closing the opportunity gap. And closing the opportunity gap never meant that you're eliminating the opportunity for the highest achievers. Yeah, um, it's so, not a lump sum game. It's not a, it's one pie that you're dividing it, right? So um, what, a couple of things. One is, yeah, the board hasn't taken any action. Um, it has been um, decisions that have been made um, in some ways sort of um, school by school mm -hmm. as they've as they've made transitions um, and they've been also looking at the um the gaps that we have also found for some of our students um as they move um and and, and miss content mm -hmm. so one of the concerns is how do we make sure that we don't leapfrog and we miss out on some really important mathematical knowledge that comes back later on when we get into more rigorous classes that impacts my my um, mathematical knowledge. Um, some kids are really good at memorizing early on. And when they get into more rigorous math, that's a challenge for them. So we're trying to address some of those pieces. We're not, and, and we're also trying to make sure that kids are challenged. Um, and at the same time that they have the skills they need as they move into more challenging classes. 
we're not moving away from providing AP or honors uh, math classes at the secondary level. We're really looking at how do we make sure that kids have all the skills they need um, early on to be successful throughout their um, educational career. So those are those. That's sort of the the, the conversation um, that has been happening um, primarily um, amongst our elementary teachers and principals. And it's obviously something that needs to be spread more um, broadly in terms of conversation with the community. Thanks. Okay. Now I want to throw in as a high school principal. One of the most common complaints was that my child took algebra one as an eighth grader. She, he needs to be moving on so that they can get to calculus. And we had to battle again and again, nicely, great to stimulate to get to algebra one, but we will develop and get your child ready for calculus as a senior. So it's not an either or. If you didn't get on the track as an eighth grader, you weren't going to get there. Sorry, we, we can get there in our high schools we have in this in the math track. So yeah. that's that's one end of the problem. Mm -hmm. The other end is is not enough students of certain categories and identities. Not and why is that? And so that's about math teachers and elementary teachers and bigger discussions. Yeah. But so it's so it's, that's so that's where we're at. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So Therese and then Lou. And uh, Lou, you will have the last word. <laughs> Therese. But uh, Lou, are you? Did you want to comment on math, or are we closing in the math subject now? No math okay. for, from Lou. Okay, uh, great. Then I, um, it's late, so I'm only going to say one thing. I wanted to give a shout out to um, the Bond team, and in particular to Kim Patton, and um, to our partner David. Um, uh, that she's been working with. I wanted to really just say how grateful I am for the effort that they put in this week to really hear from and engage our community. It was a really um, challenging, it started out feeling like it was going to be a really challenging way to find a way forward. But um, Kim really showed up and she represented our district very well. And she brought a really flexible lens to um, being able to hear from the Wildcat community. And it was a privilege to watch them at work. And so I just wanted to say that uh, for those in members in the community, which is almost everyone that doesn't get to see the on the ground um, perspective of how hard our staff are working to reach the community and, and invite voice, um, they really are. And sometimes it really does take a community member stepping in and saying, hey, I don't think that I got heard there. Can we try that again? So thank you um, to Becky for bringing that back around. And then really thank you to the district for taking it seriously and for being willing to show up. And I don't know what the final outcome will be, but I do know that whatever the final outcome is, everyone is going to feel a whole lot more ownership over getting to it now than we would have if we had just left it, if we had kicked it to the curb and just not, not revisited it. So thank you to uh, all of the individuals who were, who were involved and particularly Kim's leadership in really Really helping uh, navigate what the options were for that situation. So that's it. I'll leave everything else for another time. Oh, wait, sorry, I can't leave this one. Sammy, the student rep policy. So like before COVID, I had been working on drafting a policy to make our student representative positions something that would be actually governed by policy in our district. And then COVID happened and that fell way to the far to the wayside. And so I would like to get that back on our radar. Um, and I don't know the best way to do that because I'm sure we have lots of things to do. So I would like some guidance about the best way to, and also given the conversation about policy earlier this evening, I think that we need to re-examine the approach to that policy so far. Um, so I'd like to engage in that process, um, but I, I would like to offer to take some ownership over make, moving that forward. And we've had some really great student reps this year. So maybe the window to move it forward is before we lose contact with them and we can't access their perspective. So I wanna put that out there and you know you can do whatever you want with fitting that into all the many agendas that you have to plan. Sounds good. I I don't think it's going to be in June, but my understanding is uh, Brian and the uh, team are working on uh, uh, looking at uh, policies across uh, the state, uh, if there's any related to this, and uh, we will have something brought forward to us very soon um, in, the, in the near future, I would say, and definitely I hope that we can stay in touch with the uh, students reps for this year so we can uh, have their input into this. One and of the things yes. I wonder about related to that is that there's a policy from OSBA um, that we've taken a look at. And so I'm wondering, Therese, if you've done some um, development yourself and we should um, 
meld those two um, two documents. So if you if you've done some writing on it, it might be beneficial to send that to Parker so we can um, incorporate some aspects of that into the first read. I will do that. Yes, I have done a, not a small amount of looking around to find how different policy, dif different districts around the country have addressed the issue of student involvement and, you know, more codifying a place for student voice in decision making. And while we are unique in Oregon, um, and I do think that we do a really great job job of engaging our students. There are some districts around the country that are more progressive and even have spaces where student, there are issues where students are permitted to vote. And so I don't know, we necessarily need to go there, but I'm aware that there's quite a continuum. And um, so I would love to share, I'll send that information on. Sounds good. Thank you so much. And uh, Lou, the last word is yours before we adjourn. I panicked for a moment because I thought we had to go back to financials, but then it was under consolidated info and I was like, Phew. but um, I just had a couple of points or questions, not points. I had, one of the questions is, um, Brian, if there's like, if you can give us some kind of like rough timeline of when um, parents and families can expect like being able to get information about resources for that transition back the mental and emotional support would be great. Um, if it's like not in June, that'd be good. And so I, built, I built time into my calendar for tomorrow to work on that. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll be getting some information out Thank or we'll know. be working on getting information out. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure a lot of folk will appreciate that. And then um, just the continual support for cohort C. Uh, like we know that there's significant differences in instruction and experiences right now and whatever we can do. I know a lot of um, the um, administrators and teachers are doing what they can to support cohort C, like, um, but just that continual, like, what can we do kind of question. And then um, I actually wanted to go way back to the theater conversation. I should have jumped on earlier with this. <laughs> um, I do have a little bit of, concern over um, the, I'm really trying to, it's so late, I'm sorry, my words are really bad right now. Um, I don't like having to have um, alumni and students tell us their trauma in order for us to act and to be heard. Like to me, that doesn't feel right. And I've had, I've been in that position so many times in my life and it's exhausting and um, over the course of one's life, having to do it over and over again um, it's not very sustainable for one's mental health and emotional health. And even if they're alumni at this point, like that really, um, the one particular story that we heard earlier of how that lasting impact of the trauma felt from the theater program impacted her experiences as a young person um, resonated really deeply with me. And I'm trying to think of how we can prevent that in the future. And I was a little bit disappointed to hear that um, that the theater program hadn't reached out to Jimbo, because I made that recommendation and I way back when during the um, the SIP presentations and um, and that was months ago. And to hear that they hadn't reached out, I know that we don't necessarily direct like operations, but that felt like a really solid like this is in place and it's in place in specifically in theater doing this kind of work. And now here we are all the way in May, having to hear people disclose trauma in a public setting. And that just didn't feel good. And I don't know what we can do to better support that kind of communication. If there's resources out there recommended that really could help prevent that, like can, I don't know. I just really wanted to express that. I, don't, I know there's not much we can do as far as like, because it is operational, but I did, um, I just wanted to bring that to, uh, for us to think about for um, moving forward. So it doesn't continue to happen. And also, yeah, and the last thing too um, was just a, that appreciation for you all for all the work you continue to do and um, in your planning for next year, I know is already starting. And so thanks for announcing that earlier. And I know that we have a lot of work ahead, um, even with the short amount of time we have left in this year. Um, so thank you all for your work and the, all the staff too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, um, and thanks for the, those comments for us to continue to 
to work through and think through. Much appreciated. Um, I said the last word is yours, uh, uh, Lou, but reflecting on the trauma-informed, uh, I hope that as we get into the work of public engagement and public comments, uh, I want to reflect on how can we be inviting the public to share, but also um, two or three minutes to share someone's trauma is just not a trauma-informed way. Uh, so we need to really revise how public comments and and uh, public engagement happen in a board level in a way that people feel empowered to share, but also that their sharing is, go is not going to exacerbate their pain and harm and suffering. And uh, I wanna reflect on that uh, as we move forward. So thank you for mentioning that. And hopefully it will, it will be a continued learning for the board to be more engaging and more uh, mindful of people's uh, experiences uh, while they uh, engage and testify. Anything for the good of the order? See none, we are adjourned. Have a good night.